Yo creo, yo 
देखना पड़ेगा ठीक है इनको ऑफ भी करना है Good morning, everyone. You're requested to kindly take your seats. Um, we are to commence shortly. Thank you so much. We have the Director General amidst us. Thank you for that indulgence, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to one and all. I am Bhuvan Ravindran, a researcher at the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water, and I have the great honor to be your MC for the day. At the onset, I would like to extend a warm welcome to each of you, our esteemed delegates, to the national dialogue titled "How Can India Make Climate Information People-Centric." jointly organized by the council on energy environment and water and the indian meteorological department please also accept my sincere gratitude for having carved out time from your extremely packed schedules to attend today's dialogue bangalata raut a woman farmer from tandahara village puri odisha stares at the ominously advancing seas as she carefully voices the fears of her people and i quote we are at the near end of the sea and we are very scared we shiver with fear when there is rain and wind unquote what brings us together today is our collective will to allay this fear and strengthen the resilience of countless ordinary and vulnerable people like her to that end we are privileged to have among us all of you distinguished experts from government academia civil society and the global fraternity to discuss 
how we can strengthen impact based forecasting of weather hazards end to end information dissemination and accurate and timely warnings to vulnerable communities today's discussion also seeks to deliberate upon the gaps around the vulnerability accessibility and effectiveness of early warning systems as well as the best practices to climate proof our lives and livelihoods the voices of people facing the brunt of the climate crisis were captured by ceew through 16 thought provoking films under the project faces of climate resilience few of which we will also watch shortly as we commence today's proceedings i can't see help but see in my mind's eye ms bangalata raut and countless others like her at risk silently listening in to our deliberations today waiting expectantly for effective accessible and inclusive solutions to emerge today and beyond highlighting the importance of early warning systems shri yogambar singh a retired school teacher from the hills of rudraprayag said and i quote when we are informed we are able to protect ourselves from disasters so that we can save our lives unquote with the voices of these communities echoing in our hearts and minds let us delve into the proceedings of the day uh, getting on with some operational niceties we do not encourage the use of plastic water bottles therefore you will find glasses with water at your table uh, we will have a 20 minutes tea and coffee break at 12:15 pm we urge you to keep to the mentioned time we request you to please use the mic for any intervention since the event is being uh, live streamed the mic you see at your table are controlled from the console so you, you needn't worry about switching them on or off on that note to set the stage for today's discussion i call upon dr arunabha ghosh ceo of the council on energy environment and water for the welcome address thank you bhuvan and good morning and welcome to all of you um there are those of you who are here in person and several others who are watching this event live as we stream it um as i was thinking this morning about what to say i remembered exactly uh, not exactly but about 18 years ago when the tsunami happened uh, uh in december 2004 i remember reading a news report about how different communities had responded uh to the tsunami and one journalist had ventured uh to the andaman islands and uh, came across a community there which um had a very interesting story to say their story was in their sort of um legacy and in terms of the learnings that had been passed down from one generation to another there was a saying in their local dialect which effectively translated into when the earth shakes move to higher ground um there was no satellite based early warning that this community had but for several hundred years they had figured out the pattern that when the earth shakes something else will follow soon enough and what will follow soon enough is basically that the waters will first recede and then they will come surging back in which we today call a tsunami this lapse in time can be short or long and that is why you need more precise measurements and warnings there's another lapse in time in geological time that is underway and that is the climate crisis we now have concentrations of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that are higher than ever were in the last 3 million years now when you look at these graphs they look like tiny wiggles on a piece of paper but each wiggle is several hundred years because they're trying to map 3 million years on a graph but what you do see is that every time concentrations of greenhouse gases have gone up with a lag in geological time 
there is an increase in surface temperatures as well. So we can say that with the kinds of concentrations that we are witnessing today, it is quite evident that there will be an severe increase in surface temperatures. Now I've told you two stories, one about how a community looks at or considers data, and data is not just always numbers, and how the scientific community looks at data. Bridging the two has to be the role of the kinds of organizations and individuals represented here. Whether it is the Metrological Department and Rock Mahapatra, our sincere gratitude, not just for your partnership, but for your, also for your presence today. Whether it is an international organization like the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, whether it is universities, whether it is research institutions like CEW, whether it is the private sector that is developing a lot of the software to deliver these messages. Today, we are here not to just learn about how bad things are, but to consider how we could collaborate and bring the best of our skill sets and our capacities and our capabilities to bridge those two different types of geological time lapses, the one on the graph and the one for the community. I was given a completely different set of notes to speak, but thanks to my colleagues for preparing these briefing notes. But I wanted to actually share this slightly different reflection with you. And the reason I'm doing this is that we are just a few hundred kilometers away from a country that is now one third underwater. The climate crisis will not respect political boundaries. And how we respond to it will then depend on how we build up the capacities right down to the block and the village and the city level, upwards to the state level, the disaster management agencies, up to the national level. We have the National Disaster Management Agency also represented here and to the regional and international level. And if we can begin to bridge geological time and bridge political spaces at different levels, maybe we will set in motion a set of ideas and legacy messages that future communities a few hundred years down the line and so when the earth shakes or it warms up, everyone comes together to protect lives and livelihoods. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh, for that evocative welcome address. I now invite Ms. Shreya Vadhavan for the climate risks team to give the context setting presentation. Over to you, Shreya. Thank you, Bhuvan. And a very good morning to all the dignitaries and guests here today. It is a pleasure to host you at this national dialogue. Today, I will be giving a brief presentation on the topic, de-risking climate with technology. So before we deep dive into the presentation, I would like to highlight that through this dialogue and the CEEW research, we want to address the urgent need for a people-centric and comprehensive multi-hazard early warning system to increase the resilience of India's most vulnerable. We aim to establish and improve impact-based forecasting, end-to-end -end information dissemination, and encourage accurate and timely warnings to vulnerable communities to reduce the impacts of climate risks. So without further delay, let's get started. First, I would like to give a brief overview of CEEW, that is the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, which is one of Asia's leading not-for-profit policy research institutions. The Council has seven thematic areas and a dedicated center for energy finance. The Council uses data, integrated analysis, and strategic outreach 
to use to explain and change the use, reuse, and misuse of resources. Since 2015, CEEW has been steering the climate risks mainstreaming agenda with the first global risk assessment being released in the London and Bombay Stock Exchange. Since then, we have been envisioning a future that is insulated from the risks of a changing climate by democratizing data. We at the Council have been continuously striving to acclimatize climate risks by generating empirical evidence to climate proof policies and communities. In continuation to this, CEEW's Climate Risk Atlas's first tranche was released in December 2020, where we dwelled upon micro level hazard assessment to identify district level hotspots. Let's see what did our study highlight. CEEW's analysis highlighted that 75% of Indian districts are extreme event hotspots, out of which 40% districts are witnessing a swapping trend. That is, traditionally flood-prone areas are now becoming drought-prone, vice versa, while some districts are simultaneously witnessing both flood and drought events. We also found that post-2005, India has witnessed more than 310 extreme climate events ravaging lives and livelihoods. In the second tranche of the Climate Risk Atlas work, we did a district level climate vulnerability assessment using the vulnerability equation, which states that vulnerability is a function of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And these are the full range of indicators that were used to do a district level assessment of all the Indian districts. But what did we find? Our analysis suggested that more than 80% of Indian population is residing in districts highly vulnerable to extreme hydromet disasters, that is floods, cyclones, and droughts. India is increasingly becoming more vulnerable to floods, and the recent flood events in Assam, Odisha, Bihar are a testament to this. Eastern coasts are more vulnerable to cyclone events, however, in the recent years, Western Coast is witnessing a spurt in cyclones, making its districts highly vulnerable. The current state of vulnerability is primarily human-induced, with more than 45% of Indian landscape having undergone rapid change, leading to, fractured, leading to fractured natural ecosystems. But how do we unify these findings to compare and map our progress? Through an index? Yes, through an index that compares apples with apples rather than apples with oranges. Using the district level exposure, sensitivity and adaptive capacity scores, we derived the first of its kind climate vulnerability index of Indian states. CEEW's acclaimed CVI will help us compare each climate vulnerable district by using their exposure, sensitivity and adaptive capacity. Finally, the CVI suggests that six zones, 27 states, 463 districts and more than 600 million people in India are now vulnerable to extreme climate events. Now, as we have highlighted our problems, let's focus on solutions, solutions that can help build resilience. There are multiple solutions that CEEW's research is currently focusing on, including climate proofing of infrastructures, nature-based solutions, but today, I would like to highlight early warning systems as a solution to build resilience. So what is an early warning system? While there are multiple definitions of early warning systems across various organizations, it has taken a while to establish a globally accepted definition for early warning systems. This slide here presents an evolution of definitions provided by the United Nations, and you can clearly see how various terms like capacities, preparedness measures, integrated systems, and climate change have been added with time. At present, according to the United Nations, early warning system is simply an adaptive measure for climate change using integrated communication systems to help communities prepare for hazardous climate extremes. But we have also come a long way from early warning systems and now are transitioning to end-to-end people-centric, multi-hazard early warning systems that empower individuals and communities to reduce the loss and damage to all possible ways. They enable early warning dissemination to increase preparedness and allow early action. But why do we need early warning systems? Early warning is essential for disaster risk reduction and building resilience because of three main reasons. First, of course, 
public safety and the protection of human lives. The second is the protection of nation's resource base and productive assets, including infrastructures, investments, and properties, and ultimately to ensure long-term development and economic growth. Now, it is well established that early warning can help us improve resilience to climate-related hazards by providing information for early action. However, to be effective, early warning systems must themselves incorporate aspects of resilient systems. CEEW's research proposes a strengthened and sustainable framework on vulnerability to resilience model based on early warning systems, integrating the four pillars of Sendai framework in convergence with the sustainable development goals to enhance the disaster preparedness, reduce impacts of climate risks, and build resilience at a national and subnational level to extreme hydromet disasters. The proposed framework has two variables, the vulnerability model, which I already highlighted, and the resilience model, where we have three components, the availability, accessibility, and effectivity of early warning and multi-hazard early warning systems. The indicators considered for all of each of these components are, First of all, availability and access, uh, availability of early warning and non-availability of early warning systems in our identified hotspot districts, the accessibility of early warning systems through early warning dissemination systems, and based on the number of people covered and the tele-density ratio for each state. And finally, effectivity of early warning and multi-hazard early warning systems, which has four indicators. The administrative frameworks enabling early warning systems through policies, plans, and actions. The category of early warning and multi-hazard early warning systems based on the number of people evacuated and the financial allocations based on financial mechanisms at the national and sub-national levels, including the public and private investments in early warning and multi-hazard early warning systems. As our research primarily focused on hydromet disasters, we look at two types of early warning systems in India for floods and cyclones. Central Water Commission, that is CWC, is the nodal flood forecasting authority in India, which has installed 331 flood forecasting stations in the country till date. IMD, that is India Meteorological Department, supports the flood ser services of CWC by providing them observed and forecasted rainfall data. Many states are also partnering with private companies for installation of flood early warning systems specifically for better information dissemination, for example, flues in Assam and iFlows Mumbai in Maharashtra. In India, seven cyclone warning centers have been established by the IMD, which has developed a state-of-the-art cyclone warning service. Under the National Cyclone Risk Mitigation Project, suitable structural and non-structural measures to mitigate the effects of cyclones in the coastal states and union territories of India is currently being done in collaboration with the National Disaster Management Authority of India. The center and several states also have developed a number of APIs, apps, and dashboards to transfer the information to the communities through Satark, TN Smart, and the Common Alerting Protocol system, which will soon be a centrally enabled system for all the states in India. Now, as we analyze the three components of early warning systems, availability, accessibility, and effectivity, we give you all a glimpse of some of the preliminary findings from our study. While 58% of districts in India are vulnerable to extreme flood events, only 37% of the districts vulnerable to extreme flood events have an availability of flood early warning systems. Similarly, Seven cyclone early warning stations are present across the eastern and western coasts of India, while our study finds that there has been a five-fold increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme cyclone events across the western coasts. So, what do these numbers mean for us? To put numbers into perspective, while three out of five individuals in India are vulnerable to extreme flood events, only one out of five of these vulnerable individuals have an availability of flood early warning systems. Similarly, while one out of four individuals in India is vulnerable to extreme cyclone events, two out of three vulnerable individuals in India have the availability of cyclone multi-hazard early warning systems. That is, 66% of vulnerable people in India have an access to cyclone early warning systems, making our cyclone early warning systems more effective than our flood early warning systems. Now, to answer today's question, 
can we build india's resilience through early warning system the answer lies in innovations innovations across three areas systems technology and finance system innovations like making a shift from relief centric to response centric policies and actions and making more risk informed decisions based on granular assessments can help better predict and prepare for adverse climate events and could enhance the monitoring and evaluation of global national and subnational policies technological innovations should be standardized to global norms to allow efficient integration with existing and forthcoming infrastructural systems some states like bihar and assam have already installed early warning systems that leverage new age technologies to better prepare for extreme flood events such technologies should be scaled regionally and globally financial innovations that integrate physical climate risks into investment decision making will help reduce the cost of financing and increase the deployment of such instruments tailor made financial solutions such as the one supporting our ncrmp project are the need of the hour to promote accessibility of climate information and to climate proof our lives livelihoods economies and infrastructures conversely by reducing the impact of disasters we can avoid the financial and political burden of massive rehabilitation costs thus investing in people centric early warning systems and other measures of disaster risk reduction is neither simple nor inexpensive but the benefits of doing so and the costs of failing to are considerable so as we come to the end of my presentation i would like to thank you all for your kind attention and patient listening but while science has helped us to generate that empirical evidence to map critical vulnerabilities people and communities will bear the brunt of this changing climate but they are also at the forefront of mitigating some of these risks today it gives me immense pleasure to introduce two such short stories of hope resilience and community action can we have the videos please thank you मच्छी जो हम हम एक अंदाज लेके चलते थे कि इस पानी में हमको मच्छी मिलेगी वो अंदाज आज हमारे फेल होने लगे हैं करीबन सेवन हंड्रेड इयर्स से यहाँ पे कोली कम्युनिटी है जो मुंबई के मूल भूमि पुत्र माना जाता है हमारा ट्रेडिशनल बिजनेस ही रहा है कृषि लास्ट तीन साल से मछुआरे बहुत परेशान है तीन बार तूफान आए उसका नतीजा ये हुआ कि फिशर में पूरा साल भर बर्बाद रहा तूफानी हवा चल जाती है तो मच्छी जो रहती है मच्छी की जो ग्राउंड रहती है वो शुद्ध हो तो जाती है पहले यहाँ पर चालू थी आज के तारीख में सबसे ज्यादा भी मच्छी मार फिशिंग बोर्ड चालू नहीं है बारिश में जून में बारिश गिरने का जून जीरो सितंबर अक्टूबर तक बारिश उसके बाद में बारिश नहीं अभी तो साल में कभी भी बारिश आता है कभी भी साइक्लोन आता है अभी आप बोर्ड भेजा कल बोलेगा तूफान है अभी तीन दिन लेट बोर्ड भेजा है पहले न्यूज आ जाता है तीन दिन में बारिश गिरने वाला है बोर्ड भेजे और आदमी लोग डरता है जानते हैं लोग नहीं जाते डर से हमारे आदमी लोग नहीं जाते थे जाने आने का खर्चा लोगों का राशन पानी है जाना आना है डीजल है फिशिंग में होता है नुकसान होता है हमेशा गवर्नमेंट बोल रहा है कि तूफान आ रहा है आपकी बोर्ड किनारे पे होनी चाहिए 
सी एम एफ आर ने हमको एक अलर्ट सिस्टम दिया था जो रिंग होता था मैसेज सिस्टम शुरू किया तो सबके पास आता है मगर वो अभी तक प्राइवेट बेस पे चल रहा है जो हमको अलर्ट मिलते हैं वो अलर्ट के हिसाब से गवर्नमेंट का सुनते हैं और हम किनारे पे आ जाते हैं ताकि जीवित हानि न हो की आवाज सामुदायिक रेडियो हम लोग यहाँ पे चला रहे इसका जो सबसे ज्यादा जरूरत हमको महसूस हुई वो हुई 2013 की आपदा में कनेक्टिविटी के साधन कुछ थे नहीं लोग अच्छे से सूचनाओं का आदान प्रदान नहीं कर पा रहे थे कम्युनिकेशन टीम हेड काम कर रही हूँ मंदाकनी की आवाज एक सामुदायिक रेडियो है यानी कम्युनिटी के द्वारा चलने वाला रेडियो यहाँ नजदीकी में मंदाकनी नदी बहती है तो उसी के हिसाब से मंदाकनी की आवाज नाम रखा गया था मंदाकनी की आवाज समुदाय से आने वाले हर बिंदु का कार्यक्रम बनाती है रुद्रप्रयाग जनपद जैसे पहाड़ी एरिया है आपदाओं की अगर बात करें तो एक तो भूकंप हो गया फिर भूस्खलन हो गया ओलावृष्टि और जो सबसे मेन है वनों की आग आपदा से पहले आपदा के टाइम और आपदा के बाद उसे श्रोताओं को जागरूक करती आई है
those are just uh, two out of the 16 films that we are releasing, one every Friday from the 5th of August, all the way leading up to COP27 in November, uh, which many tout as the resilience COP. Uh, also, Shreya, thanks for a very clear presentation on the work that the team at CEW has been doing. It is now my privilege and pleasure to introduce Dr. Mrityanjaya Mahapatra. Dr. Mahapatra is the Director General of Meteorolo Meteorology for the Indian Meteorological Department and India's permanent representative with the World Meteorological Organization and a member of the Executive Council of WMO. With a PhD in physics and 28 years of experience in meteorology, he has made significant contributions to the improvement of early warning services of the IMD. He has brought laurels to the country from international agencies for effective cyclone warning. In fact, he's popularly known as the Cyclone Man of India. I would now like to request Dr. Mrityanjay Mohapatra to deliver his address. Thank you, sir. Namaskar, good morning to all of you. Respected uh, Shri Kamal Kishorji, Member Secretary, National Development Authority, Sri Ronab Ghoshji, Managing Director, CU, Ms. Shreya Vardhan, Research Analyst, CU, Distinguished uh, delegates, participants, ladies and gentlemen present here and also joining online. At the outset, I congratulate CU for taking up this uh, very important and timely initiative regarding connecting people with the multi-hazard early warning system. I especially congratulate for the presentation actually, which has brought out in very briefly, all the specific themes of this particular uh, workshop. And also it brings out the issues and challenges before each of us to carry it forward so that to make each and every people resilient to various types of disasters and hence to minimize the loss of lives and properties and optimize the socioeconomic conditions of the country. I just want to uh, bring out a few facts where we stand at present with respect to the multi-hazard early warning systems and its connectivity to the people and the measures taken so far, the gap areas and the future in a set as possible by each of us. I think gone are those days when India did not have even the monitoring and detection system for different types of natural hazards. India being a vast country, it experiences almost all types of natural hazards as it is seen in another part of the globe. About 80% of the various types of natural hazards are related to weather. And therefore, uh, weather related to multi-hazard early warning system has been the key initiative globally over the years so that we can minimize the losses. So with the advent of various types of tools and technology, including satellites, radars, automated weather stations, and various other observational tools, now there is no such severe weather which is going undetected. So that is one of the most achievement of the independent India. To add to all this, recently, since 2019, IMD, is providing information about the occurrence of lightning. It's the smallest, uh, you can say the smallest significant uh, severe weather event, which is affecting the people. And I want to mention here that almost about 2,500 people die in the country because of the lightning. But however, there has been an initiative by National Adjustment Authority and state adjustment authorities in policy planning guidelines to combat with each and every type of disasters in the country. IMD being a nodal agency for weather-related disasters, we take care of 
providing the information about the occurrence and the forecast about the occurrence in density of various types of hazards in the country. The experience says that the technology has been the key factor to improve the capability of the early warning agencies, be it IMD or Central Drug Commission or INCOES or it is GSI. And over the years, the technology is also improving. And therefore, there is scope also in future to utilize technology to further improve the detections, monitoring, and also the forecasting. If we compare the early warning system, which was there, say, for example, 10 years back and now, you will find that there has been significant improvement in all the components of early warning, not only the monitoring and detections, but also with respect to the modeling, the forecasting, early warning, and its communication and dissemination to various stakeholders, government, non-government agencies, and overall the people through various media. So if you consider the various components of management of various types of natural hazards, the early warning is the first component, and especially when you consider the South Asia, and the region is um, socioeconomically poor relative to other regions in this, in this part of the world. So which says that you cannot uh, improve immediately the infrastructure leading to disaster resilience in a short time. But if you can invest and improve the early warning, then in a very short time, you can make people resilient towards this type of increasing disasters. I am happy to inform you that the forecast accuracy, if you just look at the recent five years, for the major hazards, as you told, the cyclone, severance leading to floods, thunderstorms, heat waves, lightning, etc., there has been about 30 to 40 percent improvement during, say, 27 to 2017 to 2021, as compared to 12 to 16, 2012 to 16. All of us know that uh, accuracy about the tropical cyclones, there has been pinpointed a forecast accuracy, which has been highlighted globally and nationally also. But at the same time, uh, I am happy to uh, remember the 2013 episode, which has shown here in the pin. We know that about 4,500 people died because of that taxi road. And at that time, you know what was the status of the early warning and uh, what are the mitigation measures and uh, actions taken at the lowest level. But similar incident occurred in 2021. If you remember, in October 2021, similar incident occurred in Uttarakhand. And the actions were so uh, timely and so accurate. Can you just imagine? The rainfall was 53 centimeters in 24 hours, which was not the case in case of Uttarakhand episode, which occurred here. There was massive floods also but number of deaths could be reduced only to 20. So that is in the success story, if you compare the heavy rainfall in the hilly regions, taking an example. But overall, if you see for the country, the heavy rainfall forecast accuracy has improved um, from about 60% in 2016 to 80%, exactly 79% in 2022 monsoon season for 24 hours ahead forecast. If I consider forecast five days ahead, there was no such forecast or warning five days ahead for heavy rainfall in 2016. But now you have got the forecast accuracy of 60%. That means the forecast accuracy of 24 hours ahead forecast in 2016 now is realized for the five days ahead forecast in 2021 or 2022. So therefore it has not only improved the accuracy, but also the lead period of the forecast. And similarly, you know that forecast lead period and accuracy for thunderstorms has been by about 75% to 80% uh, 24 hours ahead and three hours ahead. As you also know that thunderstorm is also a big killer nowadays in terms of the lightning. So therefore, we have taken up the initiative to improve the thunderstorm monitoring, detections, and early warning also. And uh, we have to still go a long way with respect to thunderstorm and associated weather because they are very small scale phenomena, but they are very dangerous phenomena. They kill the people. They also lead to huge loss of our individual's property. Perhaps people do not know that they 
lose their electric connections, they lose the TV, freezes, ACs, and the poor uh, um, farmer or poor person in the village also loses the mobile system. So by that way, it becomes a huge loss for each individual. So, so there is a you know, scope um, to connect the early warning system with respect to thunderstorm and lightning with the people. So there has been uh, the advantage in terms of the, um, we have taken the advantage in terms of the forecast accuracy, and therefore we've introduced the impact-based forecast. For the last three years, for each severe weather event, IMD is providing impact-based forecast. That means we say what the weather will do tomorrow instead of telling simply what the weather will be tomorrow. And in that initiative, the most important uh, success story has been, uh, I think Kamal Sosab will uh, tell about that, the WFDCRA. We have the impact forecast for tropical cyclones long back. Uh, uh, that was the static information. So we have um, um, information about the impact on various sectors of the economy, including agriculture, industry, um, and port, shipping, marine activity, and inland activities, etc. That was going on. But uh, with the initiative by NDMA, a mega project was taken up uh, with WMO sponsored scheme uh, involving all the coastal states, and it was first implemented in Odisha and Andhra Pradesh, and second phase is uh, going on. So under that scheme, the early warning system has been connected with um, uh, the uh, disaster resilience system, you can say. It has been connected with various stakeholders, and finally, it is going to develop a um, mobile app which will connect each and every people in the coastal states. So not only that, the technology also played a uh, major role in that, that uh, all types of information like geospatial database, the meteorological database, hydrological database, and um, socioeconomic database has been overlaid to evaluate the hazard, vulnerability, exposures, and hence the risk. So risk is being estimated. And uh, it is also giving some kind of forecast of the losses. That is for the first time in the country that you will have a loss forecast for the tropical cyclones. And all of us know that uh, in the recent government has introduced the policy that the money is being released by the central government prior to landfall of the tropical cyclones, which was not the case earlier. So this type of initiative uh, towards the disaster management has been possible because of the improvement in early warning systems. Uh, telling about, Vasen um, Sahib is here, telling about the hydrological aspects. Yes, we provide the uh, forecast input in terms of rainfall to Central Water Commission and Central Water Commission provides the gas forecast. As you told correctly, we do not have some kind of um, the flood forecast uh, at a very specific manner in terms of the flood inundations. There is certain initiatives uh, like IIT Delhi Ego Science of Scheme uh, to introduce something. And but fan India, so flood inundation mapping has not been possible so far. It has been done experimentally in certain areas. So there is a huge scope there to improve the inundation. But whatever, we have taken up news initiatives and scheme recent times for example uh, for hilly areas uh, was sub scheme has been implemented for Ganga Brahmaputra basins and uh, similarly we have gone for the flash flood guidance system which is providing the possibility of flash floods and depth of water in each and every water sets initially we started with the 30000 water sets in the country with each water set of the typical dimension of 4 km 4 km and from this year we are going towards the 1 lakh water sets so that for each water side will have a dimension of about one kilometer and one kilometer. So that means that will provide at least for next six hours or next 12 hours, we provide three information, next six hours, next 12 hours, next 24 hours. Well, next 24 hours is just a guess you can say, or you can say preparatory actions, but next six hours is the real actions when we're expecting the fast floods. It is being provided to Central Water Commission and it is being provided to state disaster management authorities and it is available to this one. Another initiative has been uh, towards this, that it is um, a policy initiative with the Honorable Home Minister. Now, Central Water Commission, India Meteorology Department, and Minister of Home Affairs through NDRF are meeting each every day and formulating the guidance on the plots expected in different uh, river casements. So, um, as you told that, yes, we have taken up the initiative of I flows and um, C flows, that is, um, uh, integrated flood warning system for the urban areas uh, that has been initiated for Mumbai and Chennai, and now it is being taken up for Kolkata and Delhi. Also, Guwahati we have got with NDMA and uh, um, 
I think Terry, we have taken up the project for um, uh, Gohati. So by that way, the major uh, fraud from cities uh, are being taken off. At the same time, urban metal services by IMD has been improved and uh, you can find out all the information with respect to urban areas, including air quality and severe weather in a single digital geospatial platform. So while we go for this impact risk forecast for um, cyclones and heavy rainfall, uh, we at present, as I told you, cyclone is completely dynamic, but with respect to heavy rainfall, it is not yet dynamic. We have to develop, we are developing now, perhaps next monsoon season, we'll have the zero level uh, system uh, as compared to we have DCRA, where we will have all socioeconomic conditions and geospatial database, uh, hydrological hazards and meteorological hazards in one place. And that will give um, uh, a very good um, a support for management of uh, hydrological disasters. So at the same time, uh, the um, sectoral applications, um, especially if, if you consider the urban sector, then um, power sector, health sector, hydrology sector, environment sector, agriculture, transport, tourism. These are eight sectors we have identified. And these eight sectors bear the major brunt uh, because of the, the climate disasters. So there we are um, augmenting our applications of meteorology and there is scope to work with the people and various agencies to percolate the early warning system to the last mile and the each people. So to enable the various researchers and organizations and um, um, the, anyone who wants to carry out some kind of extension services, we have come up with um, the database. The data from IMD is freely available for any kind of research applications and development of applications. So um, the data are in digital format since 1901, and that is available specially for rainfall and temperature. The cyclone data are available from um, even prior to that. All are available in digital format. And similarly, the data with respect to other parameters like thunderstorms, heat waves, cold waves are available. Those who are interested to carry forward any research work, any application development, we welcome that. And we'll provide the data free of cost as long as it is not commercial. Whenever it's commercial, of course, someone has to pay for that. Uh, there has been another initiative, of course, by NDM and uh, IMD has been a major partner uh, for connecting the people with the climate disasters. That is a common alert protocol, which is being implemented by um, NDMA through CDAC and all state government organizations and uh, IMD and other Ministry of Arts and organizations. So there, uh, you'll be happy to know that uh, this year, starting with pre-monsoon season, all our offices, uh, that is meteorological centers, are providing information through common alert protocol. But there are certain issues, but however, a, a beginning has been made to connect people directly with the early warning systems through common alert protocol, which will take care of various languages, various media, and various types of um, formats like audio, video, text, graphics, etc. And also it will ensure that it reaches out, but there are, Again, to, uh, we have to go a long way because this is just the beginning. There will be certain issues which is to be uh, point, uh, sorted out. Uh, finally, I just want to say that um, uh, all the severe weather events and their forecast informations are available in GIS format. So WebGIS has been included. You can find our products in WebGIS, in QGIS, in text and graphics, and also recently we have connected audio and video. The information on early warning is being generated by the local language, by all our offices in the states and being provided to the people apart from English and uh, Hindi. But uh, these are some of the uh, initiatives which have taken recent years uh, along with the improvement in forecast accuracy. But still, as I was telling you, uh, we are um, in a progressive path and there is scope to further improve uh, the connectivity with early warning system that are multi-hazard early warning system. So uh, one uh, important uh, suggestion or uh, thought I would uh, I would like to uh, mention here that we have various types of multi headed early warning systems and various agencies. So we need some kind of synergized SOP and uh, some kind of common approach so that there can be interoperability. That is, uh, uh, say for example, Central Commission IMD and then GSI. So because it is a multi-hazard scenario when you have got the heavy rainfall event, there will be urban rainfall, there will be landslides, there will be mudslides, or mud sinks, there will be rain flooding, and there will be flash floodings. So there are many organizations involved in that. So interoperability of various multi-hazard early warning systems, which can have a smooth flow towards the people and the stakeholders. 
or there is sometimes the same people getting different types of information from different organizations uh, may confuse uh, the public uh, or the disaster managers sometimes. Another scheme is that um, uh, that uh, we have to uh, reach out to the people in such a way that each and every dialect, you know, country is such a way that we do not uh, have the capacity at present to reach out to the people in their own language. So we reach out to in uh, somewhere about 14 to 16 languages so far, I will tell you our regulatory advisory services or the, all the warning services are going in the system schedule languages. But uh, even if you go to a particular uh, state like say Jharkhand, or if you go to even Andhra Pradesh or Odisha, you will find that language is completely different and people do not understand even uh, the schedule language sometimes in the same place. So, um, so therefore there is scope um, and I hope uh, in today's workshop will provide us some kind of um, uh, interactive platform and we can bring out um, uh, many suggestions and recommendations, uh, how to simplify and connect the multi learning system with the people in this changing scenario which is occurring in the country. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra for that very expansive enunciation of uh, all the initiatives that have happened uh, at IMD along with its partners, including in more recent years, how the coverage and the type of warnings have increased. Um, but your last two points are important takeaways in terms of translating the messages in local dialects, not just languages, uh, but also having common templates uh, in a way that um, we are able to make sure there is, as in your words, interoperability. Um, I'm now very uh, pleased to introduce Mr. Kamal Kishore, who's the member secretary of the National Disaster Management Authority and also serves as the co-chair of the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. An architect and an urban planner by education, he has worked on disaster risk reduction and recovery issues for over two decades at the local, national, and global levels. Those very, um, the bridges that I was referring to earlier Mr. Kishore has been um, building throughout his career. Earlier, he also worked at the United Nations Development Program where he led global advocacy campaigns to address disaster risk reduction concerns within the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And previously as UNDP's regional advisor for South and Southwest Asia, he supported more than 10 countries on a range of public policy and institutional development issues. He has also served in the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center as Director of Information and Research and as Manager of the Extreme Climate Events and the Action Research Unit for Development, the STARU. Mr. Kishore has also been an advisor and a guide to a lot of our initiatives at CEW, for which we are extremely grateful, Mr. Kishore. We now look forward to how the early warning in initiatives and innovations that we've heard about already are getting translated the on-ground response. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Arunaba. And good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I am very grateful to uh, CEW and IMD for organizing this event and for inviting NDMA uh, to this event. I have my colleagues here. Dr. Krishnavats, uh, Harsh Gupta, he leads our cyclone risk mitigation program. There are other colleagues, uh, DG of CDRI, and of course, uh, you've asked me to deliver a special address after uh, Dr. Mahapatra, the cyclone man, so I don't know how special my special address can be. Uh, but what I'm happy about is that you brought together uh, a service provider and a client uh, in one room, so we can have an interesting conversation here. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Mahapatra said that in the last uh, 10 years or so, we've made the huge progress in improving our early warning systems. Uh, you know, you know, starting from seasonal scale, you know, our seasonal forecasts are much, uh, much better than they used to be 10 years ago. You know, the whole notion of uh, ENSO, Indian Ocean Dipole is integrated into it. Uh, there is uh, much uh, greater uh, resolution to um, to the heat wave forecasts 
uh, in the last uh, six, seven years. Uh, and we've also made progress in terms of reaching out to people in their languages through multiple uh, media. Uh, globally, there are 171 million people who are exposed to cyclone every year. That's the annual exposure to cyclones. And about two thirds of them get uh, uh, access to early warning. This is the calculation. And I can say uh, with some pride that in India, that's not two thirds, it's 100%. So you know, everyone receives the early warning. Uh, and we have, uh, act, we have systems at the local level uh, to actually act on that early warning as well. So in the last 15 years or so, we've reduced uh, mortality from cyclones by 95 to 98%. You know, it's not a small achievement, and it is really a reflection of the work that Dr. Mahapatra and his organization does, but also the communities that, uh, that have organized themselves, empowered themselves to actually act on the early warning system. It's really an example of end-to-end -end system. Uh, but of course, we can't be complacent. You know, that's just this year, you know, uh, as of yesterday, more than 1,600 people have lost their lives uh, in floods. Uh, we have uh, bad floods in, in Pakistan, but we have very bad floods here as well. And just as we are in the middle of the flood season, we are trying to really understand different dimensions of the flood. There are states uh, which have normal uh, seasonal rainfall, uh, but uh, the number of rainy days are, uh, you know, the, the number of rainy days are fewer. So there are more days where more than 125 millimeter rain, rain has fallen and that has led to flooding. So in other words, that shows us the limits of a good seasonal forecast as well. So uh, what I will do is um, I will quickly answer the question, how do we make uh, climate information in India are more people centric? I have five points to make. Uh, my first point is that uh, Dr. Mahapatra talked about uh, imp impact-based forecasting. And it's indeed uh, very good that in the last uh, few years, it, I think in the last three years, all IMD forecasts paint a picture of what the impact will be like. But I think we need to do a lot more. The impact-based forecasting, the impacts have to be described in a much more vivid manner. And this is something which is not something that IMD can do by itself. We really need to see how different sectors will be affected. What, is, what does a certain you know, wind speed mean for power sector in coastal areas? Uh, if sea surface temperature in a particular part of the Arabian Sea is like you know, some departure from normal, what does it mean for uh, fish catch? All of that really requires translating uh, the weather and climate forecast into impact forecast. And that really requires working with sectors, looking at what has happened in the past and forecasting impacts based on analogy from the past. That requires deep scientific work, which requires bringing together the potential users and producers of weather and climate information. If you don't do that, then you can, yes, IMD can uh, predict that, you know, wind speed will mean that, uh, you know, date palms will fall. But is that enough? Clearly not. I think we really need to go across multiple sectors. So I think that really has to be a, a major uh, emphasis in coming years. Uh, through our cyclone risk mitigation program, we are trying to connect uh, forecast with impact, you know, we have a web-based dynamic composite risk analysis system, uh, which uh, is aiming to do that, but we need to do that not just in coastal areas, but everywhere. The second thing is something I would say, uh, uh, the second point is that there has to be better articulation of what the users need. I think the onus is on the client as well to actually articulate what is it that is what is the climate and weather information that is needed in order to make better decisions? I'll give you an example from my work in Bangladesh uh, many years ago. We were working with a group and with the, the Bangladesh uh, Met Service to improve seasonal forecast. After working on it for about nine months, and when we began to talk with farmers, they said that we don't want seasonal forecast. 
you know the seasonal forecast variation does not impact agriculture what impacts agriculture is intra seasonal oscillation so we need a forecast on a 15 day time scale that is more helpful it doesn't matter how good or bad your over seasonal boundaries are but if you can't tell you know how the forecast how the season is behaving within the season uh then it's no use otherwise what happens is that you know it rains we we throw the seeds and then it dries for 20 days so you lose your seeds uh and then it it begins to rain again so if there is some predictability to intra seasonal oscillation that's just one example there are many other examples where uh, there is of course there is a wish list that users have and there is a what science can provide you know the the skills of our models in different time and space are different so you know it's but but even that overlap the venn diagram this is what the users want this is what the producer can provide you even that overlap i i believe we are not maximizing it fully so that can only happen if the users articulate the, their needs better the third thing is the third point it's sort of a corollary of my second point is that we need to have um uh, some weather information on um uh shorter time scales uh higher spatial resolution of course this has been a wish list of users since time immemorial but some of the impacts really are highly localized uh, we lose a lot of lives to lightning and that really it can't be done on a regional scale it really has to be done on a finer scale we have the uh, the damini app uh, which uh, imd has uh, produced similarly for urban flood urban flood early warning is a completely different ball game uh, uh, dr mahapatra mentioned the work in mumbai the work in chennai the work in bangalore you didn't mention bangalore but there is something happening in bangalore as well in in, in guwahati but let's admit it we've had on urban flood early warning system we've had very limited success uh, there are very few examples where we can say that we forecasted the urban flood very well and our response was really you know the same level as we do in in cyclone so i think it is really important that we sort of connect different time scales and and some of the hazards which are causing uh losses on in uh, in smaller spaces smaller uh, geographies and where the time scales have to be shorter tighter i think we need to do uh, a lot more on that you know the same exam the same thing applies to cloud burst you know we had a a tragic incident in manipur earlier this year uh on a railway construction site a few days a few weeks later we had an incident in in um amarnath uh i think uh what do we need to do to sort of uh, service uh, those kind of vulnerable geographies uh my fourth point is that i think uh while uh, there are reports uh, that talk about uh, emerging impacts of climate change uh, shreya's presentation talked about a number of cyclones uh, get becoming five times on the west coast um is it really uh, epochal or is it uh, you know a long term trend uh, what else are we seeing are we seeing more, i mean in some geographies are, are we seeing fewer numbers of heavy heavy rainy days uh, what is it that we are seeing i think on that we really need to begin to communicate uh, that some of the impacts are not projected they are observed uh, they are already happening and of course there is a fair bit of uncertainty uh the attribution science is still emerging so we can't say that this is now a, a trend that has established itself the, the there is still a fair bit of uncertainty about how this is going to progress but we have to get better at communicating uncertainty as well that you know this is what we are observing we are observing that in this part of the country you know there are the the seasonal rainfall is the same but number of rainy days is reducing a lot more days of intense rainfall so how do we which are the areas and which are the types of manifestations of climate change which are quite clear now and they are being observed we need to begin to articulate those and communicate and begin to use them in our decision making you know most of the focus of our cyclone risk mitigation program has been on the east in the first phase we worked in in odisha and andhra pradesh 
Now, Shreya is telling us that focus on West. You know, so is it really a established trend or it's just fluke, you know, that in the last uh, five years, there are more cyclones? We don't know. I mean, we look for your guidance, um, Dr. Mahapatra, on that. So that's just cyclones, but it's the same case with heat waves, same case with um, with intense rainfall, cloud bursts, and so on. And my final point is that, uh, you know, the technology and innovation, it has become a buzzword. Uh, but what was being discussed five years has disappeared without a trace now, so many technologies. So I think we need to systematize, uh, you know, the presentation that Treya made also had artificial intelligence, big data, drones, everything. So how do we put up, uh, put together an ecosystem so that we can engage with this in the long term and not just get enamored by the technology for the sake of technology, but really take a problem solving approach. With these five points, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kishore, as always, for your candor and for pushing us. Uh, Shreya, uh, the, the sign of a good presentation is that you get direct feedback in real time. We are talking about real-time early warnings. So these are some early warnings for how to make your presentation and the team's analysis even more precise. Um, Mr. Krishna, you're talking about how to translate that data and even more uh, visualize it even better. We've now got uh, data visualizers within CW as well. Um, so these are all offerings that we have that we would very much want to partner with IMD, with NDMA, with CDRI and partners in the room uh, in order to translate whatever we're getting from the still imperfect models into things that can still save lives and make livelihoods more resilient. We're at the close of the opening session, um, just a few minutes behind schedule. Um, but I would, before we move to the panel discussion, because I know uh, some of our uh, distinguished guests will have to leave soon, I would request if the panelists for today and our distinguished guests for today could just come up to the to the stage and we could have one quick group photograph before we continue with the day's proceedings. Bhuvan, you can take over for me. Thanks, uh, Arunaba. I would request our panelists from the first moderated discussion to also join us on stage, Mr. Amit Prothi, Mr. Krishna S. Vatsa, Mr. Harsh Gupta, Dr. Akash Srivastav, and Mr. Manuel Cornelis. Yeah, thanks so much. Keynote speakers are, have already joined us on stage and uh, people from the second panel as well. If uh, you're in here, Dr. Uday Kant Mishra, Ms. Stefania Banaglia and Ms. Rakele Gyan Franki. If you're there, we'll request you to join us. Well. Thank you. I would request that the Climate Press team also joins us and our partners, uh, ICC, Edu Gift, please come and join us up on stage. Come, 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 come. Let's, let's quickly do the photograph. Come on, please. Come on, Come on. Come on. Come on. Thank you.
Thank you once again to all our distinguished speakers. We will now move towards the first moderated discussion for the day titled India's Leadership in Building Resilience Through Early Warning Systems. India's experience has demonstrated to the world that combining strong disaster alert mechanisms with empowered communities can drastically reduce the loss of life. To begin the session, I first invite our distinguished moderator, the award-winning journalist, Ms. Bahar Dutt. We'll give it up for Ms. Dutt. Trained as a conservation biologist, she has worked as an environment editor with India's leading English news channel, CNN News 18, and has won over 12 national and international awards for her reportage on green issues. Ms. Dutt, we are very excited to have you with us today. Moving to our esteemed discussants, Mr. Amit Prothi, Director General, Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Sir, welcome. Mr. Krishna S. Vatsa, member, National Disaster Management Authority. Welcome, sir. Mr. Harsh Gupta, IES Project Director, National Cyclone Risk Mitigation Project, NDMA. Warm welcome to you, sir. Dr. Akash Srivastav, Additional Director and Head, Center for Environmental and Occupational Health, National Center for Disease Control. Welcome, sir. Last but not the least, Mr. Manuel Cornelis. I practiced that. I hope got that right. <laughs> Sales and Marketing Director, one too many. Miss that, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. So a very warm welcome to all of you and uh, especially to uh, the viewers that we can't see, those of us who are joining us online, a big hello to you as well. Um, thank you so much for taking the time out uh, to all my panelists you're here. I know I stand between you and coffee. Um, so I'm going to keep this session as scintillating and as invigorating as possible. Um, when Arunabha asked me to come and moderate this session, um, I looked at the title and I said, how can India make climate information people centric? And I was like, that's what journalists are supposed to do, right? Especially uh, those of us who you know, track this beat because we're constantly wondering how do we take out all those those fancy, the vulnerability formula. And, you know, I was looking at all the data and I said, how do we take this to people and make it more accessible? And I'm dealing with, you know, people in urban areas who are reading the newspaper or watching the news who would still, uh, uh, you know, be literate. Then what do you do, uh, you know, in a scenario where as policymakers, you have to put out data to people who may not, you know, be comfortable with the written word, and it has to save lives. Um, so I was totally fascinated with the topic, and I've been sitting there taking many notes. Um, and to my mind, in my, uh, you know, time as a journalist reporting on these stories, um, the, 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 the example which comes to mind is in 2019, when Cyclone Fani hit the coast uh, of Odisha. And you saw all these images of, of people who had been taken to these shelters, the cyclone shelters. And you compare that, I was told that the, uh, you know, the death toll that year was, was 20. While I believe that no lives should be lost, I think it's, a, it's uh, you know, the fact that uh, if you compare it with say uh, 1999, when another super cyclone had battered the coast in the same districts, and we found that there were at least 10,000 people who lost their lives. Um, so this is a huge improvement. Thanks to technology, uh, we are able to save thousands of people's lives, livelihoods through these early warning systems. So I think a pat on the back to our country and to the technology that is available. I think as, as journalists and as climate change communicators, we're too used to talking about the bad news. And I think we should focus sometimes on the good news. So um, I, I think we've come a long way. Uh, but how do we make this all this technology accessible to the people who matter, to the people who are impacted? I'm hoping that the panel today will be able to address some of these questions. So without much ado, um, firstly, thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to ask Mr. Vatsa 
So in the work that you do, if you could highlight through some of the experiences that you may have on how accurate and timely information in reducing the damage caused by some of these disasters that we've been hearing about today, whether it is cyclones, whether it is floods, whether it is now heat waves. Um, we have a mic there, sir. So. Today, uh, we are getting the information on all the uh, depression, how it is moving, how it's amplifying, how it's weakening on a hour to hour basis. And we can track it, we can get all the information. We have a much better system of getting to know the landfall, uh, the timing of the landfall, the, the exact site of the landfall. Mm -hmm. And all this has helped us position our responders. Okay. So, uh, and we are seeing it in one cyclone after another. So that has really helped us a lot in terms of saving lives and uh, reducing the damage. So uh, we can clearly see that in the last few years, you know, we have been able to save lives on a on a on a, a much much uh, more successful uh, uh, scale than what we have done in the past. Having said that, I would like to reflect upon some of the other things that we are really faced with. Mm. We are much more successful when we, it comes to dealing with large systems that are arising and that we are dealing with. But we need to focus on smaller systems which are really killing a large number of people. You know, cloud bursts, uh, thunderstorms, lightning. You know, these are our real challenge today. And these are very difficult to deal with because of several reasons, you know, which also involves the technology and uh, the our our presence at the at the um, at the local level. And it also speaks to somewhere the uh, the overall um, asymmetry that exists within our disaster management system. When I speak of asymmetry, what I mean is that our disaster management system functions at the district level. It's, it exists at the district level, functions at the district level. Our early warning system is largely driven by a central organization. It is led by a central organization, which is IMD. So there is a di distance, you know, there is a gulf. You know, that gulf has narrowed over a period of time. Mm -hmm. you know, if you look at 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, we 90s, I, I was working, we didn't know much about IMD at the central level. We had one sleepy office of IMD in Mumbai. We would go there sometime, hear a few things, but we didn't have much interaction with the IMD. Uh, that has uh, really improved a lot. Our interaction with the IMD has, has, has improved. IMD also has reached out. IMD has you know, rejuvenated itself you know, and revamped itself. It has a much bigger presence today. But what I feel is that it, it, we need to do much better in terms of reaching out to the district administration, providing the kind of information. What it really means is this, that we need to also go beyond IMD. IMD is the system leader for the early warning. It means that we need to have more district level organization, the state level organizations, which are providing information on early warning. And more the early warning becomes a people centric system, the more it becomes a local system where more and more people are participating. And thanks to social media, thanks to all kinds of local initiatives, the early warning is reaching out to the people. You know, it's not always government driven. It's also people driven. Yes. Now, there is already a momentum here, the, the, the way early warning system is expanding itself. This needs a bigger push. So as we give this push, you know, make early warning more decentralized, we invest more in the system, we will uh, reduce this gulf between the providers of early warning and those who act upon the early warning. And I think this is the most critical public policy challenge today. You know, how do we make the early warning more and more decentralized? 
and we are able to focus more on the the local uh, disturbances uh, that arise and that that are killing a large number of people in the country week after week these are in a smaller numbers so they escape our attention but the total number is worrisome thank you okay thank you so much for those opening remarks mr vatsa uh, in fact you've answered uh, the question i was going to ask in the second round which is what are the challenges uh, but i i, I should have just uh, stated in the beginning while i was uh, uh, in, introducing our subject for today, which is that uh, I'm going to request each of the panelists to speak for three to four minutes. Um, and then what we're going to do is um, I like to keep it more participative. So I'm going to request all of you, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we prefer questions to comments, but comments are also welcome. Um, so we will then open the floor up for you to ask your questions or give any comments, and then we'll come back for closing remarks. So that's how we're going to do it. Uh, Mr. Harsh Gupta, if I can ask you now, if I can turn to you, there's a lot of discussion today about cyclones. And what is the idea behind the National Cyclone Risk Mitigation Project? Uh, where we are in India in terms of, uh, you know, our cyclone early warning system, um, how advanced is it, and uh, your thoughts? Good morning, everyone. Now, I will be focusing mostly on the project, what we are doing. Okay. I won't be able to tell how we are placed at the All India level in these aspects. So in the project, what we are doing, as uh, a member secretary mentioned, and as DG mentioned, all the coastal states we have taken up, one of the components is early warning dissemination system, mm -hmm. amongst other things of the project. Uh, except uh, Tamil Nadu, of course, because it was covered in some other project. Under the early warning dissemination system, uh, primarily we are putting three major modules. One is a SEOC, which is called a State Emergency Operation Center, which is the heart and brain of the system, where the early warning messages are received from the alert generators like IMD, inquiries, and then these are processed there the local state would analyze that what are their threshold levels, what are the warnings they need to communicate, and in which geographical polygon they need to indicate. Mm -hmm. So they generate a GIS polygon, and then they communicate it. So the second component of the uh, early warning dissemination is the communication channels what we use. So we had under the project put up a separate communication system because in case of cyclone, it was realized that the regular communication channels break down. So there was this RF connectivity through repeaters and through huge uh, transmitters, this connectivity was put, which was used to not only communicate among the first responders when the all communications break down, but it was also used to trigger the uh, siren, which are installed at the uh, tower, siren towers. The third component is, of course, the last, which is the sirens and the alarm system which not only gives some alert siren, but also has the capability to transmit live audio messages and recorded audio messages. So this system is in place in two states now. It is functional, Andhra Pradesh and Odisha. It is under implementation in three other states, Karnataka, Kerala, and uh, what is the third state? Goa, yes, Karnataka, Kerala, and Goa. And three more states we are planning to take it up, which are left out which are uh, which are now West Bengal, Gujarat, and Maharashtra. So by this, we will be covering all the states. In the future uh, projects that we are planning, we are planning some more improvements than what we did earlier projects. What we learned that this SCOC, which I said is the brain and heart of the system, we realized that different states are attempting it in different manner. <laughs> We realize Kerala is doing it in a much more advanced manner with a lot of layers of incident command system and a lot of other features, whereas Karnataka had a very simple version. So we, we have thought and we are contemplating that can we come out with something, a cloud-based emergency operation system, which can be hosted centrally and then can be utilized by all the states, which will give them the, you know, no, no states would need to reinvent what has been done by other states. Then we are also thinking of installing these sirens. In the first attempt, what we did, we put standalone towers, huge towers were put 30 meter. 
and some were very difficult site condition near beach areas. So now we are thinking based again on experiences of Kerala that can we utilize existing communication towers of these telecom service providers. There are certain legal challenges in doing that, but Kerala is attempting utilizing the powers of the Disaster Management Act and also utilize the existing public buildings to install the sirens. The third, what we are attempting to do is that instead of going for RF connectivity, again, putting huge standalone towers. And again, there are maintenance issues of that because it is good to, you know, talk of one thing in such a rosy picture that yes, we have achieved that. But it's another challenge to maintain it at the ground level. You need to have the maintenance personnel. You need to have that commitment and drive all the time, which is only seen at the time of disaster. But during rest of the part of the year, that kind of drive and systems are missing. So we are now thinking of putting some other kind of things like now this MHA has a new initiative of VSAT connectivity under the police network program. So we want to utilize that. So we don't need to maintain separate uh, towers. So these are some of the things we are trying to do. And of course, we are trying to further improvise on the dynamic CRS system, which has been hosted by IMD. As <clears throat> Member Secretary was mentioning that this impact forecast needs to be more vivid. So we need to translate into some actionable points for the district level machinery. Which villages are going to be inundated? Which villages are, what will be the level of inundation? What will be the speed, uh, wind uh, speed? And what will happen with that wind speed to some kacha houses, to some semi pakka houses, the windows and door shutters of those semi pakka houses? So they take a decision whether there should be a blanket evacuation of people from some village or it should be a partial evacuation. So it becomes more meaningful input to them to take uh, action. So we are in the process of that. And uh, we are hopeful that we will, as of now, we have not yet achieved there. But yes, these are the tools which are in place. And we hope to come out with some more useful solutions. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, you know, as we're talking, we're talking about India and what India is doing. But we also know that as we speak, um, our neighboring country, one third of it is underwater. So how do we take, Mr. Amit Prothi, I'm coming to you now. How do we take, um, you know, these early warning systems and to help vulnerable countries and not just India, but perhaps in the region? And uh, how do we climate proof our infrastructure? So thank you for asking me that question. I think before I answer your question, I have a question for the audience. Okay. All right. <laughs> Who remembers a Category 5 hurricane in the Atlantic Ocean in 2005? Two hands. Okay, all the climate guys do. <laughs> Two hands, right? Who remembers Hurricane Katrina? It was the same storm, right? Similarly, who knows Cyclone Fani? Pretty much lots of hands in the room, right? Now, who knows Zoe? One hand, two hand, three hands. So as of last month, Zoe is the first named heat wave in the world. Okay. And if you think about heat waves, there is actually no naming for heat waves. And this is an experiment by the city of Seville in Spain. And the city of Athens is also trying something along the, this naming of heat waves. And why? Because essentially to your point of how do you spur um, action, how do you spur trigger things on the ground where people recognize that there is an event coming that I need to prepare for. And there is research indicating that maybe naming things helps. Yeah. And I say that because I used to work with the Atlantic, um, the Arst Rock Resilience Center, the Atlantic Council before I joined CDRI. And this is one of the key initiatives where they're trying with different governments across the world, with they're trying to look at categorizing heat waves based on public health impacts. So this goes back to our impact based, um, people centric impact based um, early warning systems. And the methodology there is that looking at past patterns, historic patterns of certain weather um, patterns, predicting mortality 
So it's predicting mortality where people are dying from heat waves. Unfortunately, people are not getting the attribution that somebody died because of heat wave is not written up by the doctor as a heat wave related uh, mortality. It's a, basically said, you know, somebody died of a uh, heart attack or somebody died of something else, but not necessarily attributed to the uh, heat condition. So this methodology is looking at essentially a correlation between certain weather patterns and how that has increased the incidence of mortality in local areas. And based on that, then predicting, you know, if certain kind of weather patterns is, is developing again, then there is a five to 10 to 15% potential increase in mortality. And then based on that, there's a categorization and then the highest level of categorization gets a name. The reason I'm saying that is that, you know, on the science side, as uh, Dr. Mahapatra has pointed out, there's a lot of innovation happening by a variety of different actors as to what needs to be done. You know, now we, are better for, we have better systems of forecasting, um, we have technologies, we have people innovating in this space. How do you actually trigger action on the ground is what we need to think about more carefully. And naming is one of the ways of just helping trigger individual action on the ground to reduce again risk of heat, like, you know, suffering from a heat wave. So where does CDRI come in? So I think CDRI is a coalition of 31 countries and eight members. Um, it's essentially looking at infrastructure, disaster resilient infrastructure. So the perspective that we are trying to take is how does, how do all of these different natural hazards influence the infrastructure systems? And then recognizing that often infrastructure systems are the ones that fail or contribute to a disaster getting exacerbated. So how do you actually we look at that chain and how do we make sure that the early warning systems actually are translated in a way that the actors on the ground, whether it's the power, power sector or the telecom sector or others can continue to provide certain functionality during that, uh, that particular um, natural hazard that we're predicting. So where we are sitting right now, we're trying to see how do we bring the best knowledge in the world together and how do we create a mechanism where that knowledge can then be translated for different audiences in our member countries. Um, that could be small island states, that could be our member countries that have different terrain systems, etc. But we're trying to create a mechanism where these the, the knowledge providers and the IMDs of the world can come together with their solutions. And then the, you know, Kamal said it, the, um, the you use the word users, you know, how do the users come together and how do we so actually co um, curate that conversation where there is action getting triggered in the different sectors. So that's where we are right now. It's still being developed. Um, we are relatively a new organization. So give us a little bit of time to get this right, but we will get it right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I, I think we have a communication strategy right there. Naming well, I can't say naming and shaming the event, but naming the 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 extreme weather condition that is happening, um, I think is one step closer perhaps to communicating it better. So yeah, that's interesting. And um, you spoke about the health impacts, which I think is uh, um, it's a good point to bring Dr. Akash Srivastav into the conversation at the National Center for Disease Control. Would you say, and I'm finding this increasingly, that the link between uh, the health impacts of climate change that seems to be missing in our economy. I mean, it's either doomsday scenario that, oh, you're going to die from this. Uh, but the health impacts uh, in our conversation seem to be missing. And how do we mean, mainstream this into climate conversation and policy? Um, thank you. Um, when you mentioned about uh, climate change and its impact on health, uh, uh, there are two thoughts that come to into the mind. One is about uh, climate change. Well, climate change is a very long-term phenomena, and uh, it's probably through uh, research studies that you can find that this change that has happened in climate during that long term, how has that impacted health, and mostly the work that is done by researchers. But uh, the another aspect which we've been discussing the whole day since morning today is how how. Uh, acute uh, events and climate vulnerability, uh, meteorological factors or environmental param parameters impact the lives of people. And uh, certainly we all know that um, uh, 
so many uh, deaths, so many injuries, so many disability, so many diseases happened after all these events. And so health is, is probably uh, one of the worst affected uh, sector when it comes to these events. And uh, therefore, there is a huge challenge before the health sector. Uh, over the so many years in the country, health being a state subject, uh, different state governments have uh, prepared themselves and geared towards preparedness and facing with this challenge. And national agencies like NDMA and IMD have been in support. Uh, now, uh, in year 2019, we have come up with uh, a national health program, uh, which is the National Program on Climate Change and Human Health. Uh, for the first time, a program that will address issues of climate change and environmental issues in relation to health. Uh, previously, most of the health programs used to address health outcomes of some of the other type, but this is for the first time we'll have a program that will also address environmental exposure factors and in relation to health. And uh, as you all know, it's a, it's a very wide area to cover. There are so many environmental concerns uh, to be addressed. Um, we talked about heat, uh, we talked about extreme weather events, we have issues like air pollution, and all of them have to be addressed under one umbrella. So it's extremely challenging. Uh, the program is trying to address these issues and uh, through raising awareness, through building capacity, to uh, making health sector resilient in infrastructure. We heard about infrastructure today, uh, how the uh, health sector infrastructure can become climate resilient. We are working on uh, developing surveillance systems and uh, early warning systems so that uh, the signals that have been uh, been produced by agencies like IMD or pollution control boards can reach not only the public, but also to the health sector professionals because uh, the health sector has to gear up in such events to ensure that there is uh, preparedness on time to address the surge of patients that will be coming to health sector, uh, creating special wards and facilities and equipment and medications to address those people. So all of those are uh, requirements needs to be addressed and so uh, integration of climate information and health information is certainly a very important subject thank you so much um i in fact um would this also cover things like disasters when there's a gas leak or when there's a potential um you know in there is an industrial accident which has happened which could also impact workers lives would the work that you do also cover something like that Yes, uh, it would address issues of disaster and extreme weather events. Uh, uh, presently, we are rightly now into the focus of preparing uh, state level action plans in which the states are working together with us in developing specific extreme weather related events and other uh, components related action plan uh, at each level uh, of how healthcare facilities would prepare themselves, what will be the roles of different levels of health professionals, uh, either health workers or medical officers or program officials and these conditions and what will be the network of operation, all of those will be addressed. It will also include issues of early warning signals and issues of surveillance of conditions. And maybe uh, someday we'll be able to uh, develop an IT-based platform of collecting these information. Okay. Um, Mr. Cornelius, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the fact that when a disaster strikes, and particularly, I'm also thinking of, say, for instance, a journalist who has to report from that situation, one thing which becomes primary is your cell phone, right? I mean, however selfish that sounds in the middle of a disaster. Um, but really, I mean, it's not just, say, a journalist, but also a rescue worker trying to get to the site. Um, you need information. And that information, uh, you know, because it's not visible, it's not, uh, we sometimes forget that actually that role is being played by cell phone providers. Right. And so the question I wanted to ask you was that, you know, in the face of disasters, what is the role that, you know, cell broadcast companies can do and how do they ensure that last mile connectivity when these disasters strike? Um,
That's can, all. We switch, can we switch that mic off? It may be. Yeah. Please go ahead. Is this better? Yeah. As we've heard, the uh, early warning systems and um, uh, the quality of the forecasting will increase. So um, the impact-based forecasting will require uh, the ability to communicate with the people more effectively. So being able to, uh, to tell people what to do, because in the end, if you talk about uh, people-centric um, uh, early warning and guidance to safety is telling the people what to do. So from weather, um, uh, telling what the weather will do, what the impact of weather will be, to telling people what to do and guide themselves to safety. Um, and that's one of the areas which comes into uh, scrutiny uh, after an event. So most of our uh, customers, countries, um, who have implemented several cost based public warning have faced this issue is that during an event, the communication towards the public, the direct communication towards the public did not suffice. So the sirens, SMS, apps, it did not cut it in order to guide the people to safety. Whether it's in Chile for tsunamis, um, in the US actually uh, triggered by the 9-11 attacks, uh, communication fails. Nowadays, it's, it's mainly used for, uh, for weather-based uh, events. But also nowadays in Europe, uh, these systems are being, uh, being implemented. There are several triggering um, events which have a certain character. Um, in Spain and in Greece, it has been fires. Recently in Germany, flooding. In Germany, an advanced uh, early warning system was in place with a lot of uh, communication channels. But still in Germany, people uh, perished because of floodings which happened. Um, but it might also be um, COVID. So in, in the UK, uh, a program was uh, ongoing for uh, a flood warning system. However, it was COVID which triggered the actual implementation of a broadcast-based uh, public warning. So um, in all of those events, they, uh, they looked at what can we do in order to most effectively guide the public to safety. And indeed, most of the people nowadays have one or two of these mobile phone devices with them. However, there are challenges. Um, mobile networks, they are based for spread use. So at the moment that uh, we have a festivity, networks get overloaded. If there is an event happening, a critical event, mobile networks get overloaded. So you needed to have a system which always works, whether the network is overloaded or not, or even when the network is shut down because of terrorist attack, you need to have a system which always works. That was one of the main, main criteria. The other one was timing. If you have a tsunami or a flooding, timing is of the essence. And you need to be able to reach millions in a, in a matter of seconds. Yes. That was the other one. It needs to be location-based. So based on the actual location of a, uh, uh, a citizen, uh, they need to um, uh, be guided to a certain uh, evacuation route, depending on their location. So it needs to be location-based. It needed to be uh, able to work with different languages, different dialects, mm. based, based on the region. So that was another, uh, another element. Um, and it needed to be standing out. Uh, Mobile phones, we are bombarded with all kinds of push messages, SMS, WhatsApps, what, what have you. However, if something serious is happening and the government is guiding you to safety, it needs to stand out. So it needed to have something which makes it unique. A ringtone, a unique vibration, the ability to override uh, uh, the sleep settings. Yes. Um, so it, it needed to have an impact and stand out. Um, and with the introduction of uh, WIA or the CMS based uh, public warning, which is compatible with EU alerts and, and EMA and ETWS, um, that has come onto the stage. So cell broadcast is the technology to actually get the alerts to the public, but the actual user experience is standardized 
across the or across the globe, um, where in the US it is uh, it's driving. So now you have this client, which is available in in all of the mobile phones. No need to download. No need. It's already there in iPhones, in yeah. Androids. So the so the general public does not have to do anything. Okay. I a classic example of it. I I think during COVID times you couldn't dial out till you hear till you heard the government's message on COVID and the lockdown and don't step out. So uh, none of us could dial without hearing that initial message. Of course, it got irritating later, but I think it served its purpose. So I hear what you're saying. How would you evaluate India's, uh, does India have uh, enabling infrastructure in place for these early warning systems? And how would you compare that you know, globally? I think that uh, India has one of the most advanced uh, uh, collections of early warning systems already already here. Uh, um, what uh, I think um, India is now in into the stage to to actually close the loop. So create an end to end system with multi stakeholders, multi users, because in the end, um, it's all about guiding the public to safety. It all comes down to how to reach directly the population on the ground. And all of the agencies here in, in the room, they all want to uh, guide the public to safety. Yes. And uh, the mobile channel using sub broadcast allows that to do. So it's it's multi, uh, multi event, uh, it's, it, it's regardless, but it's a trusted channel which the public will recognize mm -hmm. because of this unique ringtone, which can only be used for emergency alerts. So, for instance, in Hollywood, they're not allowed to use that ringtone during movies right. because if an event happens in the cinema, people will need to, uh, to, to, to respond to that. So you have one unique um, access towards the public where you can direct the public um, uh, directly on their location and tell them what to do. Wonderful. Okay, so we've heard opening remarks from our panelists, and I must say thank you so much for sticking to time. I didn't have to cut anybody short. Um, this is, I think, a good time to draw all of you in. Um, if there are any questions, please introduce yourself, raise your hands, and we'll get a mic to you. Yes, sir, please. Yes. Um, uh, just ask your question and also who you want uh, should answer your question. It's, uh, more than a question is a comment. <clears throat> you said that you don't like the comment, but it's still... No, no, no. Uh, I, as long as it's not a long okay, winding comment, okay. it's fine. Uh, <laughs> Please. I'm Ashwini Gursai. I'm an emeritus professor at IIT Delhi. Uh, I feel that the, to make the climate information people-centric, it's very important to make sure that you get, give the people what they want, what they're looking forward from. Now, in the case of flooding, we have done in collaboration with uh, Andy and uh, Dr. Mahapatra is here. We are now having uh, all the, the basins. We have created the digital twins of those basins. And we are simulating once we get the rainfall forecast from IMD, we are in a position to find out how much will be the discharge at any location of any of the river basin. But what we don't uh, give at this juncture and why we don't give is a reason. We are not in a position to tell them that how much will be the inundation. But that's something which is uh, needed by the individuals. If they are along a, next to a river in a city, they want to know that whether their city will be flooded, when it will be flooded, for how long it will be flooded. We have the capability. What is needed at this juncture by the country is to create the the data, which is the digital elevation models, or the terrain data, which is accurate. We are using the free data, which is given by the international sources in the form of uh, the SRTMs or um, the ASTER data, which we have been using, which is very useful for working on the conversion of rainfall into flow. Uh, that, that's what we had done. But when it comes One sec, sir. We'll get another mic to you. Please go ahead. 
So, so that is what is the gap as of now. And once we fill up that data, that gap, as a technologist, we are ready to really produce those things. We have done that at the city level, for example, we have done, created the drainage master plan for Delhi oh. um, after simulating the whole Delhi because the digital elevation model was done through a separate exercise, which was taken up by Delhi government around trip. And uh, uh, that was available to us. So we had a very accurate information because when you are looking at what direction the water will take, how it will flow. Yes. You have to use the models which are hydrodynamic models. Now, those models have to have very reliable data. If you are, if you want to create a impact in the people's mind that yes, whatever you are going, going to give, they can believe in it and they can act on it. So I think that is where our country is and we need to invest a lot in translating and now with the GIS uh, made as the national uh, requirement, if we have that information available at the earliest, we can we can do a lot and we can, whether it's uh, um, the, the, the urban areas or the rural areas, whether it's a riverine flooding or is local level flooding, we can give the warning. And I think uh, this portal, um, I, can, I can send to uh, you the, the, I mean, the link where every day we are simulating the whole country and with the revised data from IMD, we are uh, trying to update the, the flow information, what will be coming at any location of your choice in the next seven days using that rainfall forecast. And that's a huge way, I mean, uh, step forward, which can be converted into uh, many other uh, additional benefits. For example, in this simulation, we are simulating what will be the soil moisture for the next 20, 10 days. And that can be a good advisory to the farmer. They can act on it. We also simulate the crops because as part of the hydrology, what is the evapotranspiration, how the water balance of the local area is going to be. Now that gives you additional information on which crops will, I mean, if you have a, in, in the beginning, you know that this is the kind of uh, conditions, whether your crop will sustain. Okay. And the climate change uh, uh, issue is also a very big issue in terms of the rainfall agriculture. Now, they're right. again, the same models, because the model is the same, is, is mimicking the nature. So how does one, sir, access this all this information that you're collecting? How can is, people is, is get a access? Portal, is a portal which is uh, okay. uh, there. Anybody can even right now, you can see that what is going to happen in any location of the country right. in the next seven, eight days of the rivers. All right. So maybe we can request CEW to share, uh, you know, the details of the portal and uh, for anybody who's interested. Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Can we get a mic here, please? Raquel Gianfranchi from um, Everbridge. Um, I wanted to make a word about people centricity, also a comment. Um, it's very impressive, uh, the quality and the education and the information that we have at meteorological level and at technological level. Now, people on the ground need to understand the message that they have been given yes. and people are very different yes. so there is a an issue in this world already of digital inequality yes. when thinking of alerting or when thinking of informing um, we need to consider that the message needs to reach from the very senior person uneducated sometimes illiterate to the very educated modern smartphone holder who lives a very intense digital life. Yes. In case of the alerts, uh, and particularly fast reaching climatic alerts, it is the campaign that we are carrying out as a private company with international organizations, World Meteorological Organization, that in the end, who triggers the alert is very often a retired fireman who has on his back the responsibility of alerting a whole area of millions of people. So in thinking of the process chain that leads from the very uh, data intensive, uh, strongly physics based meteorological data analysis and forecasting to the person, the ultimate person who bears that responsibility, there is a gap. And there is a gap that we see worldwide. 
Yes. Thank you. Yes, I think that's a very important intervention. And also, you know, one assumes, especially in India, we're assuming uh, communities are homogeneous, uh, you know, but they're fishermen, they're agriculturalists, again, with varying levels, not just of education, but I think we tend to forget power equations within the community. There are tribal communities, Adivasi communities. Are they scared to leave their land and cattle behind? Are they worried that people, uh, you know, that the more powerful people within that village will take over their property? So there are all kinds kinds of dynamics that play out and uh, thank you for highlighting that all right questions please i'm still waiting for questions <laughs> please how much time do uh, we i'm have? nitin i'm yeah. from climate change and environmental sustainability team of unicef but my question is from my experience of working from a practi practitioner's perspective while i was with kerala state emergency operation center during the kerala floods and uh, so from that 2018 floods we have come a long way but one of the main challenges that was there was the interstate interstate state emergency operations center coordination. Like uh, Gosh sir clearly mentioned, uh, hydrometeorological disaster doesn't respect the political boundaries. So the in the river is connecting different states. Like we need more robust standard operating procedures and for early warning system. Uh, so do we have any way forward on that? And also. I would like to highlight certain solutions that came after these disasters, like Abda Mitra program, the community civil defense, and centering youth and kids, like school safety program that NDMA is leading, are some of the scalable solutions to make climate information more people-centric. Mm. So what are we going to do to scale up all these initiatives? OK, so who is your question addressed to? Uh, to what's sir and uh, CDRI, and also to okay. Harsh Gupta. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, uh, the states are coordinating among, uh, uh, among themselves quite well when it comes to flooding. Um, I mean, and it has been a long standing practice, practice, not just that, you know, in the last few years. Um, I mean, I when I was in this state, I distinctly remember coordinating very closely with the government of Karnataka. We were releasing water from the, the dams. Uh, Karnataka was getting flooded. We would alert them. We were also having the backwater effect of the the uh, Karnataka dams, you know, they, because all the dams, you know, they are storing water, so it it does contribute to the magnitude of the flooding situation. So the states would generally uh, uh, cooperate, collaborate, and see to it that uh, the situation is uh, um, managed well. Uh, there would always be phone lines uh, working. Some states may have some uh, issues, more more so personality related issues, but generally I think so far as flooding is concerned, there is a lot more uh, cooperation these days. Um, even in the context of uh, drought, I would say that you know there is a lot more cooperation in terms of sending supplies, you know, relief, food grains, and all that. So there is now a well established mechanism of interstate cooperation. Thank you. Okay, so I am going to come back to the panel for final comments on what you think are the policy gaps uh, which need to be addressed. What is the way forward for making climate information more people centric? Any two recommendations? I'm looking for those, but I'll take I'll allow one last question, please. Thank you. So I'm Manovendra Sahari. I'm an assistant professor in IIT Delhi. And um, I would like to I have a very short comment and one question. Okay. So uh, the short comment was trying to tack on on Professor Gosain's very detailed uh, analysis on what actually is needed, especially on terrain information. And obviously, uh, you know, IMD has been very forthcoming and other organizations have opened up their data sets, but we need to do a lot more in terms of inducting satellite remote sensing data sets. And that is somewhere we are generating voluminous amount of data through ISRO. But our models are not sophisticated enough, or um, you know, we have not. We have there's a lot of effort we need to put in in terms of inducting that information into our models, um, making the terrain information more accurate. So we, as Professor Gosai already mentioned, we do have an operational model in IIT Delhi. We also have a full-scale 2D inundation model that has the capability of inducting reservoirs and giving you stream flow and flooding depth all over South Asia, so including the neighboring countries. So we would love to collaborate. Both Professor Gosai and I, um, we would love to collaborate with any organization to take it forward. So that's a very short comment. I don't want to take too much time. So my question is, I heard a lot about cyclones, floods, hydrometeorological disasters, but very little about landslides. And that is such a major factor. Just the last 
two months back, we had a major disaster in Assam where an entire railway station was wiped out by landslides. And unfortunately, I don't think India has a functional landslide early warning system. I would love to know your thoughts on if any organization is working towards it or if it is something that you think is important for India to pursue. Would Thank anybody you. want to take that up? Landslides? Yeah. Uh, we are working in the area of landslide early warning system. GSI is the, is the organization responsible for that. Uh, we have mapped the, the landslide prone areas. Uh, and the mapping exercise is undertaken for the entire country. The precision is not there right now. You know, so that's really the challenge. You know, we are working on these areas and I think next four or five years, you will see a major breakthrough. Uh, this is uh, an area where we are focusing a lot of in, uh, attention. Uh, we are bringing several agencies to work together and we are also asking the state governments and the scientific organizations to collaborate. So another four or five years, we are also developing a, a national program in landslide mitigation. So all that would contribute to the landslide early warning system and you will see some major advancements. Okay, that's as I mentioned, uh, see the way forward is investing more in the early warning systems. The more we invest, the better we are, you know? And if you see all the developed countries, where they are, they are, they are it's because of this, the investments they have made in the systems. And we definitely need to emulate that. We need to uh, invest in all kinds of systems, cyclones, floods, you know, landslides, you know, smaller, uh, climatic disturbances, all of them. So that's clearly uh, the way forward. The second thing is this, that it's very important that there are different elements of early warning system. They need to come together and work together. That's very, very important. We are dealing with a very, very difficult uh, uh, situation. And see, uh, monsoon is a very complicated system, very complex system. Its complexity should not be underestimated. So that's one thing. Second, monsoon in a warming climate, that's a totally different phenomenon. How the monsoon you know, interacts with the, the climate change. How, say, you know, Dr. Mahapatra would bear me out. The rainfall is, has gone down in the recent decades. And you know, now the, the normal rainfall is about 868 millimeters from 880 millimeters. There is a hypothesis supported by some evidence, monsoon is shifting westward. You know, we, Rajasthan, Gujarat, they are experiencing more rains. We have seen the flooding in Rajasthan. So that's, that's a very, very big challenge. Whenever the monsoon interacts with Western disturbances, it, it brings a huge amount of rainfall. We have orographic precipitation, you know, rainfall in mountains, very, very difficult again to have predictions for forecasting for all these things. So, you know, it, it's, it's not so easy, you know, and people make glib comparisons with the Western countries. You know, uh, meteorology in tropical countries is very different from meteorology in temperate countries. And people need to understand this difference, you know. So what is important is that we keep working on these things and we keep collaborating with all the different elements which are different agencies different institutions which are working in this area imd is of course the leader we recognize the leadership of imd we work very closely with imd you know today itself we are going to have a meeting with imd on drought you know we we are experiencing excessive rain, rainfall in many parts of the country we are also experiencing drought in many other states so we need to keep monitoring all the situations and we need to monitor it very closely. And this is the way forward. I think, you know, uh, this is how we will improve our climate forecast. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Vatsa has actually partially, you more or less answered my question on the way forward. Mr. Prothi, if I can come to you for final comments now on uh, two recommendations that you can think of um, to make India more, uh, you know, climate information in India more people centric so, and you know, for the country that you work in. <laughs> sure. I think for me, the it's the while on the um, prediction side, 
you know, I'm not going to talk about the prediction side because clearly there's a lot of work going on and, doc and Professor Watts has already elaborated on that. For me, the interest is on the, on the actors, on the infrastructure providers. What are the SOPs they need to prepare where when you come and give them a, a warning of, you know, five days, three days, 24 hours, six hours, what is it that they need to do? And that needs a lot more effort. And I think that's where CDRI would like to spend a lot more time is how do we get those actors equipped with the right kind of um, understanding and then triggering the right kind of actions, you know, so that that's where one, one policy or one area of work for us. The second one, actually, I was thinking of what Dr. Gosai, you were saying, you know, you're talking about the model for Delhi terrain model. And I appreciate, you know, we need to have that level of thinking. But there are certain other realities also that we, we need to recognize. You know, often localized flooding is also happening because you've not cleaned up the drains or, you know, the urbanization, the patterns are changing so quickly that the terrain model may or may not be re relevant at the very local level. So how do we think beyond just the government providing early warning system? And I'll give you an example. Um, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology has a risk lab and some young, actually Indian origin researchers put together an app, which basically pulls data from Twitter and other live feeds, and then comes out with a map. And they've done this in Jakarta, and I think they tried it in Chennai, where there is actually a real-time mapping of flooding based on what people are posting. Hmm. And Uber drivers, were actually using that information to avoid those areas that were being flooded, right? Yeah. So essentially there are other actors also, right. innovators who we should try to think about bringing into the space. Yeah. And I think from CDRI's point of view, we would love to see how we can also bring other actors into this discussion to see how do we trigger action on the ground. That's so very interesting. Things. That's very interesting because it also, uh, you know, it also ties in neatly with people-centric information because the people then become the actors providing the information. And I think citizen science and citizen journalism, and I mean, these are classic examples of that. I would worry a little bit about information going on on Twitter, though. <laughs> That's the only uh, uh, footnote I would add. Um, all right. So we're almost at the end. I'm going to request the final comments to be very quick. Mr. Harsh Gupta, what, what would you say? The way forward and any recommendations uh, one of the things what we are working is on this uh, cell broadcast and recap. Mm -hmm. So this we feel is, you know, one of the most sought after and awaited uh, amongst the dissemination uh, mechanisms. We have taken up CAP uh, through NDMA. Till now, it is only restricted to location-based simple SMS. The design what we had now was C dot was given the contract and it went to all the telecom service providers and all the alert generating agencies and then maybe alert uh, alert authorization agencies to sort of tune their system to make this cap compliant. Mm -hmm. Now this has taken up a lot of time in the present design. It has taken about three, four years while the country is waiting for the thing which is already available in so many countries, this cell broadcast, which is the ultimate thing being sought after by states. So what we are thinking now under NCRMP project for, with the help of World Bank for at least coastal states, we are thinking of going with a different design that we approach our department of telecommunication, which is a regulatory agency, call all the telecom service providers across the table, ask them whether it is part of their licensing agreement, obligatory conditions, to provide the cell broadcast. If not, what is the amount of money they expect from the government? Mm -hmm. Come out with a definite figure that this is the amount to be paid to them. Mm -hmm. And then ask them to do that work in a definite time uh, frame. So that all of them work parallelly, rather than we putting somebody like CDOT and they're going on sequentially and then they're going on doing their system. And then we pay operation and maintenance cost to all the telecom service providers. And then they come out with certain complaints that how the system was not done properly. So this is what we are trying. And we are hopeful that if this design succeeds, we will be able to come out uh, with this thing okay. quickly. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Akash Srivastava, policy gaps and way forward? Well, 
in context of uh, policy gaps you see i would say that uh, health sector in itself is a, a huge sector uh, which is trying to build up its health information system and which is a major challenge for the system because it's uh, it's an information of each and every person living in the country and an information that is gathered to a, a large detail from the medical practitioner who interacts with, uh, with the given patient and then feeds it into the system. So uh, we are uh, looking forward as when and how these health information systems develop, we get connected with other information systems, uh, such as climate information systems and other environment information systems. And then we have a direct feed into the same information system to make better understanding and use of this. All right, All right. so linkage with other systems. Mr. Cornelius, any policy gaps you find as far as India is concerned and any recommendations that you would make? Not so much uh, policy uh, policy gaps, but I would like to add what uh, Mr. Gupta said. Um, if we look at all of the uh, successful subroadcast projects which we have done around the world, in those successful projects, um, uh, the um, all of the stakeholders and with subroadcast you need the full cooperation of the mobile operators. Um, and they are a stakeholder in these kind of projects itself. And that makes the, the project quite complex because they have different interests than the government. And one of the key things to address is always a big elephant in the room. Who's paying for what and how much? And even if there's nothing paid and it's mandated because of telecom regulations, that's also an answer. But the key thing is to answer that question to get the elephant out of the room so that all of the stakeholders can focus on implementing a successful project within the timeline set. Because also in India, there will be in the next couple of months an event which will drive the, the needs of the introduction of this, of this system. And so um, I think the most important thing is, is already here. It seems that there is a political will of all of the stakeholders to actually implement. And that is the, well, the key and most important thing because from a technical perspective, CUP is already there. Um, uh, we have integrated with uh, a, a lot of agencies using CUP, made the tr translation from CUP into the cell broadcast domain because CUP is in another domain than cell broadcast and there are technology specific elements that need to be addressed. Um, and we can help to be, let's call it a neutral party because there's always some tension between governments and private organizations. And we take the role of a neutral party who understands the mobile industry, the mobile technology, but we also understand because we have been now for more than 15 years in the uh, public warning domain, we also understand what the government, what the different stakeholders are looking for. Um, so that is, Okay, like those, those are excellent final words. Thank you so much to all my panelists. Uh, we've had a number of recommendations today um, from naming extreme weather events to focusing on some of the smaller uh, events like landslides or lightning issues, um, which we tend to neglect. Otherwise, thank you all so much. You've been a wonderful audience and I am not going to deprive you of your coffee or tea. Thank you. <laughs>that it is the tireless efforts of countless experts like each of you, which is the silent force behind strengthening India's resilience to climate change. We now have a 20 minutes break for tea and coffee. Uh, that means we will assemble at 12.55. Please feel free to browse our publication desk right outside. Digital versions of each publication are also available on the CW website. And I just seek your indulgence to reassemble by 12.55. 55, please enjoy your...
12.45, my apologies. Please enjoy the refreshments. Thank you. Hello, is it okay? Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon, sir.
good afternoon sir so uh, i hello sir so are you getting the voice we need to check the audio uh, audio thing from your end sir Ah, uh, hello, sir. Uh, sir, are you getting our our voice? Uh, you asking me? Yes, yes. Or uh, just I am checking audio. That we are receiving your audio or not? Ah, uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, sir. Ah, uh, sir, we will begin shortly. Ah, uh, right now we are having a tea break. So in the next ten minutes, we are uh, back to the session. Okay. Hello. 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 Is it is it okay? Yeah. 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 Is visible. Ah. Uh, yeah. I'm able to get your audio. Perfect. Thank you Thanks. so much. We will. Ah. Uh, we will begin in the next ten minutes. Okay. Thanks. Welcome.
ठीक है And feeling more comfortable for the rest of the session. We will now move towards our second moderated discussion for the day, titled "Building Community Resilience Through End-to-End -end Early Warning Dissemination Systems." We will discuss how appropriate, tailored communication of warning information is critical to ensure that people get the right knowledge at the right time and in the right way to act in anticipation of climate hazards. To begin the session, it's my honor to first invite our distinguished moderator, Professor Janki Andharia, Dean of the School of Disaster Studies, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, TIS Mumbai. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us today for the session. We can be a little more liberal with the claps. Thank you so much. With over 37 years of experience in community organization and social development, MAM has been involved in national and state level policy making work and has had a long association with grassroots organizations. We are delighted to have you with us, Professor Andharia. Moving to our esteemed discussants, we have uh, two panelists joining us virtually. Uh, beginning with those present in the hall, Mr. PM Scott, Member, Central Water Commission. Sir, I call you on stage. Thank you so much for joining us today. Secondly, we have Ms. Rakele Gian Franki, Director, Government Affairs, Everbridge International. Thank you. Joining us virtually um, are Ms. Stefania Binaglia, EU Asia Public Diplomacy Expert, Center for European Policy Studies. Welcome, ma'am, and thank you for joining us for the session. And Mr. Pradeep Jena, IAS Development Commissioner, come Additional Chief Secretary and Managing Director, Odisha State Disaster Management Authority. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I now hand over to our moderator, Professor Ndaria. Ma'am, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me over and special thanks to CEW and IMD um, for inviting me. Disasters and climate issues typically have been sort of male centric and uh, I, it didn't sort of, uh, I didn't miss the fact, I mean, one was, it was very evident that in the previous panel, you had mostly men and the only woman was asked to moderate. But yes, I think we learned to live with uh, this reality. Uh, I've been with uh, 
the disaster sector for many decades, but more from the perspective of the community and also from the policy lens. Uh, my first experience of doing disaster response work goes back to 1982 and uh, that too in Orissa. Uh, uh, way before disaster management was sort of discovered as a domain of work or, I mean, we are now talking about uh, climate change and extreme weather events and so on. But uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences has had a very, very long history of doing sort of response work, which goes back to 1947. And I always sort of uh, pay my respects to my predecessors way before I was born, who actually realized that it was very important for uh, university systems to actually be engaged with uh, the community out there and uh, since 47, we have had this sort of uh, voluntarism that you see uh, within university systems that we respond as corporate citizens and uh, in disaster situations. So we've had a lot of experience with regard to working on ground and uh, uh, there's a strong institutional memory which I would like to invoke uh, when I'm making a few opening remarks. Uh, we have had we have a very very distinguished uh, panel uh, we've had i think one person who's not going to be with us on the panel that is dr udaykan mishra so i'm going to take the liberty to make a few quick opening maybe critical comments which actually link what we've been talking about in the earlier session to what we are discussing now so my first point is that uh, uh, we need to recognize that extreme weather events typically um, reveal the underbelly of uh, societies. And we need to really move beyond looking at the impact of a specific event to looking at pre-event conditions of development in any given society. So unless we make this link, we are going to be handling, okay, this is going to happen and what do we need to do about it? The focus on events is fundamentally problematic, and we need to really look at sort of data, information, developments on a continuum of what are pre-existing conditions. So I just want to sort of put it out there, put it on the table, that uh, what are pre-climate change conditions, which in fact impact what actually transpires when you do experience uh, specific weather events. Um, and the title of this, uh, it's very interesting, very attractive, very appropriate. Um, we need to ask this question, why is it that climate information is only science centric? And why is it that it's not people centric, nor is it policy centric? So it's a point of reflection. I want to put it out on the table there. And uh, the second issue really is which people we are talking about. I think that was a point made earlier that communities are not homogeneous? Are we really looking at the last mile? Are we really looking at the most vulnerable communities? Why is it that they get excluded? So there's certainly something fundamentally wrong in our normal developmental processes, which also needs to be fixed before we sort of start looking at, you know, specificities of what happens when, you know, you experience an extreme event or a disaster or, you know, various sort of implications of climate change. Um, the second thing is uh, India is a very large country and uh, we pride ourselves. We have won laurels, we have won wonderful awards with regard to innovations and pilot projects. You name a sector and we have a wonderful pilot that is out there. Our basic challenge is doing something on scale. So that's really something that Policymakers need to think of, or this discussion needs to include some reflections on how do we do things on scale. And it's really wonderful that we have people from the government who have worked on this. Um, in the international communities, we talk about accountability to at-risk communities. I think this is something that's gaining a lot of ground. We also talk about risk-informed planning. Now, as a country, we lend our voice to all of this. But the question really is that um, at an operational level, what is this accountability that we actually witness? 
Do we really see accountability in the way in which our government agencies function? Our accountability typically seems to be to our immediate bosses, make sure that you don't rock the boat, keep the system like a, it operates uh, with a business as usual approach. So I would actually like to propose that uh, it's very important for us to not just talk of capacity building of local communities, but capacity building at the higher levels of decision making, ministers, secretaries, and so on. And unless we do that, unless we mandate some of these things out there, you're not likely to see uh, an impact at the grassroots level. So these are my three sort of uh, opening points or remarks. And uh, perhaps we keep this at the back of our minds as we sort of uh, move forward. Uh, let me invite uh, Mr. Pradeep Jena. He's a very uh, well-accomplished uh, IS uh, officer from the Orissa Kada, a very senior officer at that. Uh, may I invite uh, Mr. Jena? Uh, he actually traverses exactly the kind of questions that I have raised, and I'm sure he'll have a lot to contribute uh, with regard to what Orissa as a state has uh, accomplished, the kind of leadership it has been able to provide, particularly since the 1999 super cyclone. So uh, they will probably, he, we would like to ask him uh, about uh, his journey, the journey of Orissa as a state with regard to cyclone early warning systems. Um, and it's regarded as a pioneering state, which is showing us the way. So could you sort of share some of the experiences that you have and the role of information in uh, early warning system? Over to you, uh, Pradeep, sir. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to, to be part of this session, though I was not very sure if I could uh, join even virtually. So I have snatched a few, uh, maybe half an hour time from some other engagement I have deferred. Uh, but then I may be called any time because uh, in a system when the, my, sometime your time is not your time, it is somebody else's time. So you, you, so, so maybe I, I'll try to stay in this session as much as uh, uh, possible. Okay, coming to the session. Thank you, IMD and C, Triple C, C W E W. Okay, for for organizing this consultation and uh, the opening remarks. In fact, have uh, uh, expanded the scope. Uh, and, and, and rightly so, in fact, disasters should not be, disaster management, management should not be thought from event-centric responses. Uh, the entire whole cycle of disaster management need to be uh, understood and therefore acted upon. But the problem I must admit uh, before I talk about what is up, why this is becoming event-centric? Possibly there is, it has something to do with the political systems that we are operating in. And the way the uh, society, the media, the political parties uh, attach importance to only one aspect of the entire cycle that is response. After response phase is over, media doesn't highlight the issues. TV screens don't class about the plights of the people and therefore, whoever the powers be, once they are not to be seen on the TV screens, why should somebody bother? Possibly that is one of the reasons there is not much of pressure in other phases of the disaster management cycle on the system. That may be the only reason I think why other aspects of disaster management have so far not got that much of focus, the way the response phase is getting, and we are talking about early warning uh, dissemination system from that response point of view. Then coming to Odessa's experience, way back some 23 years before 99, October 29th, we had a super cyclone. In fact, the strongest cyclone to have hit uh, this country. And that point of time, I was a young district magistrate uh, in neighboring Katak district. And uh, those days, yes, on 24th of October, I believe, I got a three, four liner v, VHF uh, message, wireless message from the government saying that a cyclone is uh, 
going to hit Odessa and uh, the district must prepare. So that point of time, nobody knows what is preparation, what sort of things the district administration is required to do. So the only thing that I being the closest uh, district Katak, I came to the secretariat, asked the then relief commissioner of the post which I am holding now, I said, well, what should I do? He said, okay, you are not a coastal district anyway, you are not touching the sea coast, so why should you bother? Be prepared to help other districts. I said, Sir, but what exactly happened? I have never seen a cyclone in my life. He said, no, 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 Katak district, you don't worry. I have, I'll, I'll talk to the other collectors. Okay, since uh, you are a trading center, you'll be ready to provide relief. Okay, so I, I then went and called on the chief secretary. I said, sir, uh, any specific instruction for me? He said, no, you are not a coastal district. Okay, fine. Ultimately, in my district, 410 people died. And on 26th of October, I, I don't know what happened to me. I went for miking in the entire district that something very severe is going to happen. And therefore, people should move to safe shelter without knowing, without the collector, collector without knowing what a safe shelter is, where are those safe shelters in the districts. I just asked people, go and find yourself, locate yourself in some safe, safe places. And then I got so much of uh, scolding from the then Chief Justice of Odisha High Court, the then DG of Police, and the then a very famous politician who individually rang me and scolded me, why are you creating a panic in this uh, district? So ultimately, anyway, I did what I wanted to do. I just went on miking, I didn't stop it. And ultimately, I lost 410 plus people in my district. And the state lost more than about 10,000 people. And all of us have seen what is the devastation. And you look at the language of that warning, the two, three sentence warning, a cyclone is going to hit Odisha around Paradi, at what velocity, what is the area it will impact, nothing. And then last two, and last almost three years, yes, last three years, I have managed seven cyclones in the state as the Special Relief Commissioner and MD of State Disaster Management Authority. And in last seven cyclones, I'm happy to report that there has not been a single loss of human lives at least. So from about 10,000 deaths 23 years before to making it virtually zero means the state has done something. And that is where only state has not done it on its own, but yes, the predictive technologies of IMD, maybe the uh, forecasts issued by IMD, CWC and other agencies that have certainly helped us. And then apart from that, Odisha institutionalized disaster management, we are the first state to have a state disaster management authority, then we are the first state to create our own uh, specialized uh, disaster response force, then we are again the first state uh, to have a multi-disaster task fire service, our fire service doesn't fight fire, they fight all other forms of events, uh, uh, including railway accidents to cyclone, to collapse structure, to chemical, biological, radiological, all sort of, so they are a multitask uh, response force. So, so we have tried to build institutions at the state level and then taken the institution down up to the village level at the district, sub-district level. And that focus on building institutions have strengthened our response system. The moment we get some information, I'll talk about the inform, uh, early warning dissemination technical aspects a little later, but the moment whatever information we get, we effectively, we are in a position to communicate to our district officers and down below right to the shelter level committees and the community members, including women self-help groups. So that has possibly helped us in uh, reducing loss of lives. But then as Professor Raj uh, talked, about the entire gamut, it's not about only saving lives, but we have so far not been able to minimize the loss of life loss. That is, that is a much bigger concern for all of us uh, than, than only saving lives. Saving properties, saving uh, life loads, saving the economic loss, that is also equally important. And what can we do about that is still a challenge for all of us. So that is, that is what we have done. We have used the technological support provided by the central organizations. We also have our own hydrometer, uh, 
small uh, rudimentary organization where we try to context contextualize it to the state and sub, sub district and sub district level and then communicate those information using various means of course unlike 23 years before now we have uh, a good uh, uh, we have 122 coastal siren towers we have sms we have uh, whatsapps twitters all social media electronic media all because of all of those things possibly the conveying of the messages is becoming very uh, it's have become better though sometimes this multiplicity of media sometimes create a bigger problem of rumor mongering and the best problem that i am facing in odisha is that i have two stalwart meteorologists who are one of them is a retired uh, med chap who was heading the center here and the other one is a retired professor dealing with supposed supposedly dealing with meteorology in the agriculture university both of them also try to remain relevant to the system and thereby they come up with their own predictions and most of them are variants with the imd predictions and that causes so much of problem for me unless unless on how do i synthesize whom to believe whom to uh, disbelieve is becoming a big problem for me and then how do when electronic channels are flashing all these different views how why should people believe me unless i share credible credible warning messages and that is where how we have to in the future possibly we have to uh, think of giving more credible weather information and met informations uh, to the people at this stage i will say this thing then later on i will talk about these technical aspects thank you thank you very much uh, mr jena for uh, bringing out sort of uh, very very relevant uh, points and actually demonstrating what uh, orissa has done in a very short time um just the fact that uh, i think building institutions and in my opinion energizing those institutions because i think in in a country like india we've talk about democracy but our grassroots democracy really needs to be strengthened along with uh, the centralized sort of institutions that exist the scientific institutions that exist and i think you have rightly pointed out that making those connections ensuring that communication becomes more actionable is uh, extremely critical so uh, thank you very much for uh, you know highlighting uh, many of these issues and also contrasting the situation from 1999 to uh, what the situation is today it is true that uh, orissa has uh, become a leader let me sort of now invite uh, uh, mr scott who's a member of the central water commission uh and uh, maybe he can also share with us what is the journey and how do we sort of uh, look at central water commission which very often now is uh, in the middle of i mean it's uh, often constitutes sort of an entity that's in the eye of the storm a lot of criticism a lot of questioning uh, that does happen but uh, uh, i think the cwc is also sort of gearing up to uh, communicating and ensuring that uh, uh, the management of uh, the waters is such that people are uh, more protected and people get uh, information which is more timely and so on so uh, let me welcome you and uh, ask you to sort of uh, give your uh, comments on uh, what are those uh, systems that have evolved uh, within the cwc over to you thank you ma'am uh first of all uh, uh, i apologize that uh, i could not be present uh, during the uh, time of inauguration uh, but uh, anyway i am glad that uh, i am here thanks to cew so as ma'am has pointed out uh, we in cluc um, we have been uh, involved uh, in looking after the rivers and forecasting floods for quite a long time we have been more or less used to a particular sort of rhythm but uh, of late uh, due to a host of factors one of which can be climate change we find that that rhythm has uh, gone out of sync with what 
uh, we were used uh, to it. So we found that uh, there has been an increasing uh, number of extreme events, whether it is uh, in the uh, flooding pattern uh, or in the frequency. And we have woken up uh, to this occasion. Uh, just as an example, because we are monitoring rivers, hundreds of them uh, in all these 20 river basins of the country. Till about uh, 2015 or so, the extreme events were countable. Uh, just a few of them, uh, for example, just like rivers uh, surpassing their past levels, which, which we call highest flood level. Till 2015, there were just a few of them. But uh, from records, we have found out that now in uh, 2021, from four or five in 2015, we are now almost touching about uh, 60 rivers having surpassed their highest uh, levels recorded. So this is one factor uh, which has uh, woken us up also. And uh, as we find, uh, there are states uh, like Kerala and Karnataka, which have been witnessing floods, uh, unlike in the past. So from our side, we have a number of uh, hydrometeorological stations set up all over the country. The first one was set up uh, at a place called Hatida on Ganga River uh, in Bihar. And now, over a journey of 72 years, so we now have about 1,730 such stations from where information is uh, collected and uh, processed and uh, the forecasts are formulated and then it is disseminated to the people. Uh, again, ma'am, as uh, how we have evolved, earlier we used to have a system where data used to be collected manually and the data flow, information flow, the flow of warning used to be really slow. But with passage of time, uh, we have also now upgraded. Uh, we have introduced uh, telemetry um, in our system whereby sensors are put uh, installed at the various stations. And then uh, we have uh, speeded up, enhanced uh, the response time. In this regard, earlier we used to uh, issue forecasts based up to 24 hours. Now, from 2017 onwards, uh, we have started issuing uh, advisories three days in advance. And from 2021 onwards, the advisory covers a five day five days in advance. And uh, of course, uh, the dissemination system is uh, through uh, various uh, means, whether it is electronic or social media, Google alerts. Uh, this is all uh, uh, what I can say uh, for today. May I invite uh, Stefania now? Uh, Stefania, uh, uh, could you share with us what are the kinds of uh, national and international policies uh, that could help sort of uh, make uh, information dissemination more people-centric from your sort of uh, understanding experience? Over to you. You'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to today's discussion. Um, today, I would like to contextualize the discussion and bring in the EU element. And in particular, I would like to bring in two elements, the EU-India Connectivity Partnership that was established last year and the Free Trade Agreement, which is under negotiation. So starting with the Connectivity Partnership, 
which just as a background is defined as transport, people to people, digital and energy. Of course, for today, we focus on digital and energy because it is widely accepted that energy transformation and digitalization go hand in hand. So much so that actually in 2022, the EU strategic forecast um, report titles Twinning the Green and Digital Transition in the New Geopolitical Context. And if you're curious, there are 35 pages of recommendations on how digital and energy can reinforce each other. But why do I want to talk about connectivity? Because the real challenge is the creation of an innovative financial system that drives growth and generates return. And why does it matter? Now, I would like to quote an article from Aruna Bagosh and Nandini Harinar saying that in 2022, India received only 2% of the overall renewable energy capacity investment, as opposed to 23% of the EU. And international investors say that there are not enough investable projects. And here is where connectivity partnership can really be the game changer. As we speak, the EU actors, the EU, the uh, EIB Bank, uh, European Commission and various actors are creating a new public-private partnership. There's a huge effort ongoing to identifying the projects that, and the areas of highest potential and of course the roadblock to implementation and how the EU can be a solution to facilitate this process. Because it is well understood that the key to the solution is an innovative public partner, private partnership where the public identifies the priority and the private, the solutions. Myself, for example, I'm actually working with RIS, the think tank um, located in the beautiful India Habitat Center where you're actually sitting in right now. And we're working on the mapping and the analyzing the connectivity projects between the EU and India to identify the ones with the biggest potential. The key issue is indeed to harmonize and coordinate and streamline the plethora of factors and actions that the EU member states, actors like the development banks, the private sector, et cetera, et cetera, and the EU institutions through the, its own projects are carrying out to maximize the impact of these joint initiatives. There are good lessons that can be learned here, also in the Indian context, which in some aspects replicates the richness of the EU diversity in the number of factors, and we've heard about this previously. The second element I want to bring in today is the foreign trade, the free trade agreement, the FTA. Of course, it's still early, too early to talk about this, but clearly there is a huge potential there. The EU tabled a proposal for 20 chapters, and there are one chapter on digital trade and one chapter on energy and raw materials. Now, it is actually easy to imagine how the combination of a connectivity partnership that facilitates the identification of investable projects and an, invest, an FTA that regulates and facilitates the business exchanges in energy and tech can really have a huge potential. To conclude, I want to bring in a last element, which is the Trade and Technology Council, which the EU established with India. Uh, by the way, the EU has another Trade and Technology Council with the US and is establishing one with Japan and is trying to bring the three of them together in parallel tracks. This council is really important because it tackles the joint development of future technologies. And of course, for what we're talking about today, this is absolutely key. So I really want to conclude on this note with the mentioning that the Trade and Technology Council, which the EU is carrying out with uh, India, US, and soon to be with Japan, to really enlar enlarge the picture because partnership and coordination aimed at gathering critical information and replicating the best practices is key. And we've heard about this with concrete examples previously. India can really become the game changer for climate change. It has the capacity to develop technologies in a very efficient way. And as, it, as you kindly said at the intro remarks, the key issue is scaling this up. Now, in this initiative, such as EU India Connectivity Partnership and the FTA, can actually unleash the potential of this private sector cooperation and attract the global investment, helping to scale up these, um, these pilot projects. Because the key is an innovative public-private relation where the public identifies the priority and the private finds the solution. And if well managed, this co coordination can really be the game changer, not only for the UN and India, but of course for the global climate change challenge. Thank you. I stop here for now. 
Thank you very much. I think you've really sort of uh, broadened the debate and uh, uh, I would say at some level also um, made very significant sort of uh, points with regard to the kind of investments that are tech potentially available. But then the question really is, is the country ready to absorb? And if so, uh, what kind of mechanisms do we need? Uh, and uh, I would like to sort of flag this whole question of uh, investing in projects is one part. The second part, which is internalization, is extremely critical because unless we do that, we remain at the level of claim making by people at you know, the decision making level. So if you say, do you have this? I think India very proudly is able to say, yes, we have done this. We are able to showcase many things to the international community. But I think you have another world where the underbelly of the country sort of resides and uh, uh, there are serious challenges with regard to internalizing all these sort of wonderful, innovative, uh, international level uh, projects. But I think that's, uh, it, it's, it's very useful that you identify where we are as uh, a country and what is the potential that's sort of waiting to be realized. And perhaps these are things that we really need to uh, work on. Uh, let me sort of on that note invite uh, uh, Rekele and perhaps uh, she's from the uh, Everbridge uh, and uh, uh, I sort of invite her to tell us a little bit about uh, what are some of the best practices uh, in India or in the world which you think uh, might be useful for us as a country. Over to you. Thank you. Hello. Yes, thank you. And um, I'm, um, I would like to make a bridge from the big picture that we have just seen and heard, Japan, India, the European Union, the United States. What is the common trait of all these countries? Well, all these countries have people who are exposed to climatic risk, to increasing climatic risk. And um, I'm very honored to be representing Everbridge uh, here. And I thank the Indian Meteorological Office and CEW for having us. As a private sector company working for 20 years in critical event management and public warning, uh, what do we bring to the table? We bring the practical experience of having implemented public warning systems in 23 countries and five continents. Each implementation requiring a specific configuration asked by a different operational setting between government at national level, state level, district level, so we have been confronted with a different configuration of risk management around the world for several years. And what is it that we would like to share with very experienced and very advanced meteorological research modeling and data detection is that we would really like to see action. We would like to see action mobilized on the ground because um, unless early warnings, uh, detection, forecasting really reach the population um, and cover this last mile that has been discussed since this morning, we still are not saving people. So picking up on what um, Shreya's described uh, this morning uh, in, in her research, unless the message is available, accessible, and effective, people will not necessarily understand it, and they will not be able to get themselves to safety. So in India, we are already present by supporting the effort of disaster management in Odisha, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, West Bengal, and Gujarat. In the world, we are also present with experience. Um, disseminating emergency messages is still 
the weak element in the end-to-end -end hydrometeorological value chain. And this is what we are advocating with the World Meteorological Office, with the International Telecommunications Union, with the World Bank. Focus on how people are getting the message. Is it available? Are there telecom networks that are covering the entire country to allow the message to reach a maximum amount of population in seconds? possibly through cell broadcasting, as we were listening this morning. Is the message accessible? Is it equitable? Or is it reaching the old person as well as the young, super educated, digitalized person? Is it reaching the person on the beach through a, a siren? Is it reaching through Facebook communities on social media? All this is available through CAP. CAP is an international protocol that is globally accepted, but it is a protocol. It is not a full communication means. And in Amsterdam, we will be hosting in September the CAP workshop, which sees an international community, including many Indian representatives. Um, finally, why India? Because India has 1.4 billion people. It is an enormous continent, full of richness, full of capacity. And when it will complete its implementation at national level of the public warning, we will be happy and hope to have contributed to making 1.4 billion people safer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for. Uh... Uh, sort of putting out there what your aims and vision uh, is. Uh, but I would also like to add that one is passing on a message. The other is people need to know what to do. Once you receive the message, where do they go? What do they do? Is there a sort of a fallback? I think uh, Orissa, for instance, has constructed very consciously over the decades uh, cyclone shelters, which double up, of course, uh, with World Bank aid and so on. But I think that's a very important question that okay, once you get the message, what are you supposed to do? You know that something is happening, but one needs to really sort of make sure that that information then becomes, as they call, actionable with clarity on what the action should be. So again, the idea of integration and ensuring that uh, different agencies are responsible for diverse activities. So those agencies need to get sort of integrated in terms of uh, the messaging and uh, the action. So, uh, uh, yes, certainly there is a lot that uh, needs to be uh, done. Uh, before I sort of open up for Q&A, um, I just want to ask uh, each of the panelists to sort of respond to uh, this question of what are the current gaps that... Uh, and limitations that you see within your own systems. So uh, shall I start with uh, uh, Mr. Jenna? Um, what, what, what are the things that remain to be done and what are the gaps that need to be plugged uh, despite all the wonderful things that Orissa has done? Would you like to flag a couple of them, please? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. For, in, fact, in fact, that was what I was trying to keep for the end. In fact, yes, early warning uh, is very important. Disseminating early warning is important, but then what warning we should miss, but disseminate is also important. And what is the quality of that warning? Whether it is timely, whether it is qualitative, if it is not qualitative, maybe sometimes people would say, okay, government gives this sort of information, but never materializes. So people would lose their trust and faith in the system. So quality of uh, warning this warning is also very important and i'll give you a small example uh, last year we had a cyclone called yes and imd gave us some forecast i would have loved to have a much clearer uh, forecast but it said the 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 cyclone is going to hit the landmass anywhere between paradip and sagar island a stretch of 250 kilometer of land where do i search that where it will hit okay so it should have been a little more clearer that would have been, that would have helped me uh, to prepare steel better. Second part of this thing was 
Suppose the cycling sticks to the predicted path, it's fine. But if it bears, say, half a degree, one degree north or south, then what happens? At the field level, this, these are critical elements for me. So the chances of the cyclone sticking to a path or taking a little bit of turn up or down, that should also be forecasted by the specialist organizations. That's second. Third thing is that, yes, the very typical cyclone, why I'm saying, keep, one is wind action. We know that wind action, there will be some wind action. It was predicted to be about 150 to 160 kilometers per hour, gusting to about 170 kilometers. That's fine. So at least we know what would be the likelihood of damages, what are the areas where it will uh, uh, damage the most. That's one part. Second part was, okay, it will be accompanied with a storm surge of about three and a half meter to four meter. So understanding storm surge and then again conveying it to people, which are the very which are the villages which comes under the 3.5 meter to 4 meter uh, storm surge level is also very important. Otherwise, we can't save lives. So what we do, where integration and convergence is required, immediately immediately uh, rang in Koi Hyderabad. Can you give me what are my potential villages which will be uh, within that 3.5 meter to 4 meter uh, zone? and give me precise village-wise information. And I got it. I shared with my district collectors then videos, and then I asked for complete uh, wholesale evacuation from those villages, whereas targeted evaluation from other areas, blanket evacuation from all those villages, and targeted evacuation from other places. So as a result, what happened? I, my death count became zero. That's not important. What was important was I could reduce orthopedic, orthopedic injuries also to bare minimum. Single digit figures of orthopedic injuries in that particular cycle because of good inputs. One is by IMD supported by inquiries. I could convey it properly and follow the strategy whereby you could do a good quality evacuation. Then what happened? There is a third component which immediately after the wind phase was over, we are busy in for wind response, suddenly we got alert, okay, the, the, a heavy amount of rainfall is happening in two places, which might cause flooding in my two river systems. So within eight hours from wind action, our entire response changed to water action. So immediately we moved boards, immediately we reorganized ourselves in those villages and started flood operation. And thank, thankfully, though we had a medium to high flood in two basins in summer season, again, we could uh, evacuate uh, the livelihood uh, low-lying low areas and, and that is how we saved lives. So coordination is very important, but Quality of the forecast is also, I think, I think both IMD and CWC need to do something. Sometimes the words that are being used in communication that, okay, there will be widespread heavy to very heavy rainfall with extremely heavy rainfall in one or two places. Can we be a little more specific? And there are technologies available which can say precisely there are hydrometeorologists and there are models which possibly can give us more pinpointed information about the type of rainfall and the surplus that can be generated at a particular point of the year. That CWC model uh, is there. And this last week I had a very severe flood, uh, 10 years high flood in one of the system. And we could precisely manage the flood without uh, any embankment breach, only six minor embankment breaches were there. We could manage only because whatever information we got from CWC and IMD, we worked with our own hydrometeorologist within this uh, government and some retired uh, chief engineers, and we predicted what is likely to happen in which place. So, so the macro level analysis is also important, and sometimes the state may not have the capacity to do macro level analysis of those weather data. And maybe one thing in the country, we don't, unlike few states like Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and maybe few other states, they have a good density of automated weather stations but many states are not having. Right now we are working with World Bank to have, have a uh, uh, lending program for installing about 7,000 uh, automated weather stations across the state so that our data collection will be better, quality of uh, analysis will be better and therefore our quality of forecast can further uh, improve. 
So, so what is important is that we need to think of a, creating a grid of a national grid of automated weather stations or land recording stations. Similarly, a national grid of river uh, telemetry, the data collection center systems for, for understanding how much of flow is coming from uh, which river. Many, many of the streams and rivers are unguessed. We don't measure them. And this time I had a terrible shock. Suddenly I found that three lakh cubic of extra water is coming into Mahanadi. I said, where from it is coming? I have been water resource secretary for five years. Then department engineers were very, very uncomfortable answering my question. I took Okay, I am releasing this much of water from Hirakut and this much is coming from Tail Basin and suddenly I'm getting three lakh cubic more. Those unguessed rivers are contributing that extra. So how do I measure those things and how do I do my plan and uh, uh, warn people, send the message to the people that okay, though this much of rainfall has happened, this is resulting in this much of extra water because we are not able to measure certain areas. So there is still need for adopting maybe better technology, better modeling, or maybe better camp or, or systems at central level. And simultaneously, the states need to also invest. Both central organizations and states need to work together to, to make a robust data collection system and a robust analytical modeling for giving precise information. Nowadays, people, people don't accept anything than precise information. And let me tell you, this climate change has really challenged the capacity of the hydrometeorologists. And urban flooding is going to be a major challenge for us in future. It has already become. And unless in urban areas you give share precise information with people, at the cutting edge level, our officers will be roasted alive. So, so there is a need to strengthen the early warning uh, data collection system as well as the analytical system in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think for that uh, honest and uh, sort of experiential sharing of uh, where some of the problems lie. And on that note, I think I'd like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Scott to sort of reflect on some of the issues that he has uh, highlighted, you know, that uh, we do require more integrated sort of data systems. And in my opinion, I think it's a very good thing that people do not accept substandard vague, generic information, because I think as a country, we do make claims and we say that we have the best of technology. Now, that best of technology, which we have secured using public funds, should be at the service of people. Why not? And I think that's a fantastic sort of statement that he's made, that people don't accept, you know, uh, poor quality uh, data analysis and so on. I think that's that's a great move forward in making something people centric. That there is a groundswell where better quality data is being demanded. I think that's uh, wonderful. Yes. So, would you like to sort of uh, identify gaps, challenges from the ground? Uh, thank you. I am in a complete uh, agreement with uh, Jena Saab. Uh, that one solution to address this, especially those uh, what uh, we call ungaged catchments, is to have a densification of uh, meteorological stations and link them uh, with telemetry. And <clears throat> another uh, point uh, that uh, I would like to share is that, uh, as uh, my uh, co-panelists have mentioned, that the core issue is to get the information uh, regarding disaster <clears throat> or impending uh, danger to the people on the ground. Uh, but uh, we have also come across such instances where uh, a person in a house in a flooded area he has been approached that yes, it is time to get yourself evacuated and you have to leave. All this was done in a timely manner, but we have come across such cases where there is too much of a love of home. Come what may, I will not leave my house. So these are certain things also which uh, uh, has been reported uh, within CWC. So. <clears throat> To address this, I think uh, we need a lot of uh, sensitization 
to be done uh, for these uh, flood affected people that uh, after all life is more precious than my house or than my belongings or than anything and the other point uh, the challenges which uh, c lucy has been uh, facing for example in north india by and large uh, the floods which uh, we face they are more or less due to extreme precipitation whereas if we go down south the floods are due to i should say release from dams although these dams are meant to be controlled structures but in times of disaster we find that they have they are more or less uncontrolled so this is one such uh, experience which uh, we find in cwc and uh, the other thing is uh, uh, of course uh, related with uh, that uncontrolled is that there is panic for the man who is operating the gates now uh downstream of a dam if there is a, a lot of uh, habitations and all so uh, we need to sensitize that before i release i need to give warning i need uh, to inform uh, my uh, lower riparians and uh, to address this uh, now we in central water commission we are coming out uh, with what is called an integrated reservoir operation because within a basin uh, there may be several dam owners several states and we need uh, to bring them together through this uh, system called integrated reservoir operation so uh, this is what uh, silusi is now currently uh, uh, doing and it has started with uh, ganga basin in the first place All right. Thank you very much for that input. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Stefania, who needs to leave in the next ten minutes, uh, and uh, Rekele thereafter for any final concluding uh, messages or statements or points that you might like to make. Over to you, Stefania. Thank you. I will be very brief, also because uh, perhaps in one sentence I could say it all. Sometimes the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. And I'm pretty sure that the audience today understands perfectly what I mean with this. So I'm not going to dwell too much into this because I'm sure you have plenty of examples of what it means, even within the same institution, let alone different states and different institutions over there. But I actually want to, uh, to respond with this with, again, underlying the potential and the, uh, what the role of the connectivity partnership can be to solve this, this problem, because this is really meant to bring all the pieces of the puzzle together and to enhance the cooperation. And I also would like to finish with a little warning, uh, because of course, uh, we all know that information is power. So we are heading towards the centralization of data. And at the same time, we need to strengthen and update our democratic institutions, because with the centralization of the information, we need to reinforce the checks and balances to make sure that they, we avoid the risk of mismanagement of information. And I think I've said it all in this brief time. Thank you very much for having me today. Great, great points, Stefania. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And a timely sort of warning, which you know, we sort of uh, all institutions, all scientific uh, processes, all data collection is always sort of uh, projected as something that the nation needs or humanity needs. And then finally, uh, what you actually see unfolding is that the entire control rests with a few people who decide uh, what to do with the data. So I think it's a very sort of uh, critical point, especially in the context of making something people centric because we tend to forget once those institutions are established. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I'm mindful of the fact that you might need to leave. Uh, so we really appreciate you joining us uh, online, despite the time zone differences. Thank you. Um, over to you, Rakele. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, I will also be extremely succinct. You asked about the gaps that we see in our specific field. And in the specific field of you know, emergency communication uh, that we work in, um, the gap that we see is the one of effectiveness. Uh, the data is there, the modeling is very advanced, the coordination globally among meteorological and data sources is established. Um, there are organizations and agencies and committees representing all these bodies, but who is talking for the people? Uh, the effectiveness of the message is not only what degree of science we communicate to the people, but what they really understand. If they do not understand the emergency, they cannot understand the emergency of the message that is passed to them, then to some extent, we remove the value from all the upward part of the value chain. So I think we should all focus on, you know, how to make emergency communication more effective, more granular, um, to save more lives, livelihoods, and livestock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, rich uh, inputs that we have received from all the various speakers. Uh, I'm going to open up the floor for discussion, questions, comments, reflections. So uh, maybe we will take about three or four at one go, and then uh, perhaps you can identify yourself and also indicate who the question or comment is directed to. Um, anyone? Yeah. Yeah, I'm Dr. R.K. Jinnamani, uh, working as the uh, head of the Cyclone Warning Division and also heading the North India Rooms in Regional Specialized Meteorological Center, WMO. So I have a comment and a question also with respect to Jena sir, as you know that uh, he is leading the Odisha to, uh, you know, already very upload. Uh, his comment about, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 degree north about uh, years moving. So that, of course, we understand the issue. And second is regarding the location of the, you know, one or isolated places, extremely heavy rainfall. So that's the worldwide, actually, the, we, we follow the best in the world. I must tell that we have a 10 petaflop computing power. We are fifth in the world after Japan, US, and Europe. We have uh, we run two global models, uh, taking best from UK and the USA. And we look all the three centers, European, UK, and the USA, and we follow the consensus. So that way, uh, and as you know, that India is very big. And uh, if you talk about any European country like UK, it is just uh, like Uttar Pradesh. So when you are looking such a vast uh, country affected by so many events, somewhere heat waves, somewhere and coastal district, particularly by heavy rainfall and cyclone, uh, Western Himalaya, Eastern Himalaya, it's really challenging. But all our stakeholders, we are trying to do the best. Now coming to the question specific to the Madam you, please, as you know that gender inequality in the disaster management, you might have seen whenever there is a flood, there is a cyclone, the state agency, this is my personal uh, question. Uh, there are pregnant lady, and as you know, the, there is a gender bias also. So is there any best practice in the world, or is there any work in India that how the lactating mother, how the you know, patient, or how the pregnant lady are addressed by different states? Is there any publication available? Or is there any center or NGO working in that direction? Thank you. Okay, thank you for that uh, question. Anybody else would like to uh, ask any question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. My question, I'm Ganesh. I work at the Council for Energy, Environment and Water. Okay. Uh, my question is directed towards uh, uh, Mr. Prateep Jana, sir. Uh, so thank you for your comments today and your service. Uh, I just had a quick question, uh, sort of taking some insight from the previous technical session that had also happened, where there was this general consensus that one of the issues when it comes to 
disaster risk management is in terms of the providers of this information, the forecasters and the modelers, knowing what exactly is it that the users on the ground, the people want in terms of, uh, you know, actionable insights and also what is the sort of data that is required for district level administrators and so on to, uh, to, to act on that kind of data. Um, what in your opinion is the availability of such data to district level administrators? What are the challenges in terms of uh, communicating your needs to central level uh, organizations like the CWC or uh, IMD? And what is uh, what has been your experience in terms of the sort of reciprocity between or the interconnectedness between uh, district level administration and central level um, forecasters? Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes, please go on. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Aryan. Uh, my question is specifically to Ms. Gianfranchi and Professor Andharia. Uh, I was still thinking about the last mile uh, data, distance submission of data and how the, uh, we can make the climate for information reach like every each person uh, surpassing the barriers of language. Uh, I was thinking if you, uh, if youth can play a role in that and if education and schools can also support in that. So if you could comment if any if there are any best practices or any messages uh, which like youth can also play a role in disaster management or in providing climate information that would be really helpful. Thank you. Any other? The DG is here, so uh, we will not have another round of Q and A. So anybody else would like to? Uh, this is your last chance. Uh, because once the responses come, I'm going to close the uh, second session. All right. Uh, no? Okay. Uh, so the first question was uh, with regard to, uh, you know, cyclones. And uh, I think the reality is we need to understand that there is a certain degree of uncertainty with regard to the way a cyclone behaves. I think Oki is one such example. So how much of, I mean, it is historically, I mean, worldwide, it is known that cyclones can make a sudden turn and so on. So there is, there are issues of predictability beyond a certain point. It's not such an accurate uh, science. And that is the nature of weather it is something we need to understand. So while we do sort of appreciate, and I think that's the point you were making. Uh, but I think our issue of effectiveness has a lot to do with all the various levels through which this scientific information is translated down to the last mile. And I think those gaps, those issues, we really need to plug. We also need to work through a language which is finally comprehensible to the last mile. So there are far too many sort of uh, levels and we need to plug that. I think uh, we definitely, I think many people, many of our panelists have spoken about it. And uh, there is an effort, but there are gaps too. So let's recognize that and uh, uh, make sure that, yes, it, it, these are things that we need. This is all work in progress. Some states are better off and some states are still struggling. Uh, with regard to the question which was directed to me about uh, best practices and gender, uh, I want to reiterate the fact that if pre-disaster times, your gender parameters in the state, if they are weak, it actually tells you that uh, uh, the state is not, does not have systems that are gender sensitive. And one of the sort of well-known, well-established indicator of uh, how we are faring with regard to gender is the sex ratio. So if your sex ratio is adverse, then you know that pre-disaster, your gender uh, equality is something that you need to address. Now, in a post-disaster kind of a context, are there best practices? Plenty of best practices. Number of NGOs have worked. UNICEF, for instance, actually supports special sort of packages for pregnant and lactating mothers. So I think there are lots of, if you sort of Google for them, best practices, you will get. Uh, so as I said earlier, correct. So most... Right. So what, the, what we do have, I mean, I can quote a couple of examples, but, you know, in the interest of time, I was uh, not doing that. But for instance, we've had in Uttarakhand after the deluge, one of the things that the state government did was to gather systematically a list of all pregnant women 
who were due to deliver during that period, you know, because they knew the houses were gone, some places, uh, the primary health centers were not functional. So they tried to mobilize all of them, have them picked up and take them to, uh, you know, a place where they could reside. So I think there are, uh, there are examples, and there's a fair bit of work happening. My point is that, why does it take a disaster for us to actually do all of this? Why is it that pre-disaster you do not have services, which, you know, I mean, these are things that we should be fixing even before a disaster occurs. So I, I think I'll uh, leave it at that. Uh, we can talk during the lunch break uh, further. Um, I think there was a question with regard to uh, the uh, issue of uh, what the gaps, and that was to uh, Mr. Jenna. Uh, how, how do you ensure sort of uh, that uh, the providers of information and uh, what information people need, uh, particularly um, at the last mile, what are the challenges and what are the kind of uh, achievements, uh, if one could uh, put it that way, what are the possibilities out there? Would you like to uh, respond yeah. to that, Mr. Jenna? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll respond to all the three questioners. Uh, uh, to first, Dr. Janamani, in fact, it is not uh, uh, a question on the credibility of IMD. It is basically the path, the journey that you have take, undertaken in the last 23 years of my at least association with disaster management. We have a fair amount of expectation from you. Our, as we, are, we are becoming aspirational and uh, we expect that, yes, IMD can do it. And that is why every time I suggest that let us let us spend more resources, adopt better technologies, and along with issuing macro level data, can we gradually give specific warnings at for micro level at the sub-district level? The, the question is availability of data. The second question, Dr. Ganesh, yeah, that is the availability of data. From that point of view, all of us have a uh, Rather, we demand that IMD and CWC and agencies like central agencies like IMD and uh, CWC, uh, please give us more granular, more effective data so that it becomes easier for us to manage the ground level situations. So it is not about the competence of IMD or nobody is questioning the credibility of IMD. In fact, uh, Dr. Janamani, you regularly follow me during those cyclone and floods, and you must have seen what I share with people every day in press briefings, compulsory three press briefings a day, where I say, okay, many models are telling like this, however, I will go with IMD. Because in the past, for, for simple reason that nobody understands Bay of Bengal better than IMD. Okay, so having said that, yes, we have lots of expectation from you. So that is the part one. Part two, regarding pregnant women, yes. I would uh, agree that many states have started doing a lot of work for uh, gender and issues. Is how do we mainstream gender in our normal life so that it will not be a special activity during disasters? Okay. But 2019, during Cyclone Fane, we issued a circular which has now assumed the form of a standard operating procedure that whenever we get a cyclone warning or a flood warning for those specific areas, we advise that WCD department and health department immediately, they are maintaining the register. So we contact all the pregnant women, those who are having a EDD of seven to 10 days of the event date, we save them to hospitals of subdivision or district level hospitals and we take care of them. And very interestingly, during last years, on the day of the cyclone, 754 births took place. And the mother and children were all happy, healthy. So, so, so that is that 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 is that is that is now part of our SOP. So every district, the moment warning is there, this immediately those two departments swing in person. Then getting the women's self-help groups involved in the entire cycle, starting from warning dissemination to shelter management to uh, damage assessment. If you, that is what we are trying to do. I, I'm not, I, I can't vouch that we are the best, but we are trying to improvise on our, the way we deal with uh, gender issues. Not only gender issues, disability issues, issues of the disability, issues of the children. So they are, they are also very important. 
then coming to giving data at the or making data available to the district and sub district that is the most difficult thing in fact they want precise in fact many of my collectors would ask me in the dead of the night sir is it going to affect khaira block or this block or nilgiri block that is where i need support on micro level data generation the information what i get is basically a broad information that we try to work with imd cwc we work with the local offices we work with uh, say infosys inquis as i said and then we try to synthesize the information and make it available to the districts and in some cases sub district level data also we call out of the whole data that we get and and share but then sometimes we may, we, we we are still not at the best in doing so so that is where more capacity is required then coming to the role of youth yes you youth uh, have a plenty of role in disaster management and uh, i would only say one thing in odisha we have just started incorporating disaster management in the curriculum from standard 8 to plus 3 final year this year it has gone into the texts of standard 8 9 10 all the in fact and plus 3 first year plus 2 first year it has gone and in next 3 years we are going to cover disaster management uh, climate change disaster management including pandemic management in and the curricula uh, right up to graduation level that's right secondly what in odisha we have just started with our state open university uh, we are uh, we have already developed the curriculum it is now uh, uh, being vetted by pedagogic uh, committees programs for politicians right from ward member to the chief minister everybody has to be trained in disaster management similarly all officer right from chief secretary to the peer there are four modules module a for mane group d employees module b which is group a module module a plus plus something like that so it is a incremental level of learning for different layers of government servant that is now being made compulsory and in next two years we have to roll out all 100 percent of the government servants have to be trained have to uh, generate their online certificate similarly for the pri also we are doing apart from these online courses we are also having several thousand number of field level trainings going on every year so 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 training and capacity development is very important and unless people know what is a cyclone how it can affect them and what they should do or what they should not do any amount of pushing information possibly will not be well appreciated by them so so it it has to be a continuous exercise and that is what uh, in odisha we, we have started uh, doing i think many other states are also uh, following the similar things okay thank you thank you very much for that comprehensive response uh, and surely i think uh, uh, the question of what is the civil society's engagement is what is the scope of course i think civil society does have a role to play no doubt but i think we should not forget the fact that in a democratic system uh there is a very strong structure of governance you know at multiple levels and we need to make each of those levels more and more accountable and also integrated in the way in which they function and i think the question is really one of what is the mandate that an agency articulates for itself is the mandate to basically gather data or is it an understanding that all this data should be made available at the service of the community i think this latter part really needs to be internalized and i think india as a country while we are very good in data gathering at some level i mean in, from the scientific institutions uh these institutions do not necessarily think that it is their mandate to reach the last mile it is somebody else's job to reach the last mile i think that is really a fundamental issue that we as a country need to you know address in order to make sure that the rich sort of experience that we have the rich databases that we have uh, the scientific pool that is available to us is actually translated into policy and action we cannot have data saying something modeling model saying something and you have like a whole range of actions which defy everything that the data is telling you so we continue this i i think this was a point that i made uh, earlier that we continue with business as usual when you know floods have occurred 
why would you construct something in the middle of uh, you know that region i think th these gaps which uh, which we really sort of uh, need to acknowledge that these exist and uh, we need far greater political will to uh, sort of uh, reach the last mile and make uh, the country more uh, resilient and i think the idea of uh, people centric sort of approaches becomes significant there uh, on that note i am going to thank all the panelists uh, uh, for joining and giving their valuable time i think many of us have traveled uh, and thanks to everyone for their questions and their sort of uh, and of course thanks to uh, cew and imd thank you very much Thank you. Thank you, Professor Andharia and the distinguished panelists for those insightful and uh, actionable thoughts. It's my pleasure to once again invite Dr. Mitunjay Mohapatra, Director General, Meteorology, IMD, to give the concluding remarks and lay down the way forward. So over to you. So at the outset, I express my heartiest congratulations and greetings to all our uh, participants, dear participants, especially the distinguished panelists for their active participation, interaction, and very well thought out suggestions and recommendations. Certainly, the initiative taken by CU along with IMD will go a long way in implementing the recommendations uh, which have been suggested in these two technical sessions. I will uh, not repeat here, but uh, what I find that considering the theme of this workshop, that it should be the climate sections which are people-centric and towards the directions when we have uh, listen to all our experts, panelists, and also the distinguished participants here, that it is desired that early warning should reach out to the last mile, last person, in such a manner, in such a format, that it is easily understood, easily actionable, and it triggers action by the individual, by the society, and by the organizations. The second uh, um, point what we could find out that it should be impact-based, but impact-based should be more granular, more specific. Say if I am in a crop field, perhaps I will expect that the impact should be crop field specific. If I am in an industry, I will expect that it should be industry specific. Or if it is a small um, a trailer, applying in the coastal water. So here she will expect that it should be specific to the trailer or coastal ship or the small boats. So therefore expectation is quite high. So what we find that uh, even we are not able to quantify the expectations of the users. So there is a need for assessment of the users needs from various communities, sectors, and which will help us to fine tune our deliverables. The, the third point, what I find that um, to have a successful impact-based forecast or risk-based warning with respect to all types of severe hazards, you need a lot of data. And those data should be digital in format. And specifically, if I just, uh, uh, categorize, it is the meteorological data, then hydrological data, then geophysical data, then you need the um, geospatial database, and of course, you need the socioeconomic data. And the resolution of this data and the volume of the data 
will depend upon the targeted groups. For example, if you are going for urban plot uh, specific, then you need more dense uh, specific data. If you are going for riverine plots, your um, uh, resolution can be compromised to some extent. So accordingly, so there is a need uh, that we should uh, highlight in every platform and we should find out the ways and means uh, to acquire all this data in a common platform so that uh, it can be easily accessible, it will be easily available, and hence um, it can be used for impact-based forecast development and early warning risk uh, assessment uh, modules for each and every specific sectors and specific groups. The other point what is coming up that we should also take into consideration the uh, socioeconomic fabric of the country. It is a large country. There is a large variations from one part to the other part in terms of caste, creed, religion, community, and gender, of course. So therefore, uh, the system, the early warning system, multi-hazard early warning system should be in such a way that it is catering to different uh, vulnerable groups. Maybe the children, the old age, deaf, dumb, blind people, for us, we have not thought of about that. So therefore, there are uh, various types of strategies in the society which need specific information. And all this information, one second, I'll tell you, it should be in such a way that they can understand. So um, the uh, next point, what I uh, find that um, an institutional mechanism for that. Yes, we have the institutional mechanism uh, under the disaster management plan with respect to the various disasters, various types of natural hazards. But uh, where we lack actually, when we consider this impact, this forecast, there is some kind of interoperability or intercoordination among the agencies and among the cross-cutting uh, sections of the society. The same society may be confronted with various types of multi-hazard at a time being provided by the different agencies. But the overall impact has to be communicated in such a way that the action can be taken simultaneously and it can dealt with all types of hazards working at the time in the particular place. So that perhaps there is a scope for where we can, uh, of course, globally also people are thinking about that. And then uh, another point what came off that um, uh, it is not the simply early warning which can do the wonders. So you need the preparedness, prevention, mitigations, disaster resilience. Uh, not only depend upon only the early warning, it depends upon the adaptive capacity, it depends upon the response, it depends upon the availability and accessibility, accessibility and capacity of those people. So therefore, um, there is enough scope also to demonstrate the resilient infrastructure and resilient society to deal with. Uh, maybe some kind of pilot can be taken up. And for this purpose, uh, the data uh, from different agencies has to be carried out. And we can demonstrate that it can be done um, for a given cause. So, um, so apart from that, uh, institutional mechanism and the uh, roles and responsibilities of these early learning systems, therefore you need the roles and responsibilities of the various um, uh, players, like the NGOs, the government agencies, the various societies, and of course the individual uh, person concerned. So it is a big task and it is a very beginning, not only in India, but also worldwide. There has not, uh, not been uh, a march forward by any other country also, I can tell you. This uh, concept, what we are discussing today is uh, very nascent stage in many countries, including the developed countries. And you should be happy that we are not far behind. We have also taken up all this initiative and we are also working together. And I am hopeful that uh, we'll certainly achieve what we plan and all these words of recommendations will certainly help to fine tune. It can suggest the recommendations to the individual organizations, and also the disaster management agencies, states and centers. And also uh, it can be uh, some kind of um, uh, white paper, uh, which can be uh, looked into by various agencies for the future uh, requirements. So I will not stand before you and the lunch. Thank you very much uh, for giving me an opportunity also to take part this uh, uh, interactive meeting and to have the knowledge gaining. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra. Very good afternoon to all. I'm Vaibhav uh, from CW. Uh, Dr. Mahapatra said he's standing between you and lunch. Probably I'm the last one standing between you and the lunch. I'll be very short. Uh, first of all, it is great to have this discussion today. As a 
in the presentation in the morning shreya mentioned that we we want to move to a, from from analysis to towards solutioning that extremely important for us and that different ways of thinking about solutions early warning system is an extremely important part of it and that was a discussion that we had today so we are very happy to have all of you you know here for this discussion uh, uh, we are a think tank and something very important for us is to you know uh, is to think about the biggest problems and challenges and that's where the role of the panelists and the moderator comes in and uh, today also in the discussion all the panelists have really forced us to think a lot about solutioning this uh, on this very important agenda i would really uh, like to thank all the panelists for both the sessions and the moderators for their contribution for their time for joining the, the discussion today uh, i want to thank our partners imd and imd has been a premier organization in this field along with the other partners like cdri uh, ndmas and the state disaster management authorities they've really done very wonderful work in the last uh, you know 10 15 years all of us know about the the kind of change that has happened on ground because of the pioneering work done by all these organizations so i am very really, very thankful for uh, for you know partnering with them uh, not just for today's event but in the longer term partnership that cw has with all of these uh, organizations i also want to uh, thank uh, india climate collaborative and idil give foundation for their support uh, in term in in the research climate risk work that uh, cw has been doing and that support has been very very helpful for us for building our in house capacities as as well as the networks to push this dialogue uh, you know sustainably uh, finally i want to thank really our outreach team and bhuvan for the excellent mcing uh it's not just about the convenings that we do but also as you would know arnaba said in the morning that cw is releasing 15 uh short movies on climate risk uh, every week we'll be releasing something every friday till cop uh, so the excellent work done by outreach team all the colleagues in the outreach team is really taking this dialogue to a very different level so i'm very thankful for the outreach team for their their contribution uh, finally the climate risk team the team that has curated the discussion and is the is the foundation for all the work that cw does a round of applause for the climate risk team uh, especially you know shreya gorab shravan uh, hamid and pallavi all of you have, have really taken this discussion forward today uh, and very happy to be continuing this dialogue with all of you now i'll definitely not take any second longer i'll welcome all of you for lunch today and we'll carry on the conversation over lunch thank you